Okay, all rise, please. Okay, for those participating at home or on, uh, online uh, with staff, uh, we'll have the mayor call the meeting to order and then go right into the singing of O Canada. Okay, all right, we're ready. Everybody, welcome to our city council meeting of Tuesday, February the 28th. We're going to start off with our traditional way, as we always do, with the singing of O Canada. So first off, uh, let me introduce, uh, do we have our uh, singer here? We're going to bring our singer up to the microphone, if you would, please. And make sure, is the little red light on the microphone? Can you see, is the little light on, the button? Oh. Now it's on? Yeah. Okay, so let me introduce you first, okay, honey? Our singer for tonight is Brianna Werhan. Did I do that right? Yes. Okay, great. Brianna attends St. Vincent de Paul Catholic School. She's in grade five. She's been singing for a couple of years with Sandra Mason and has participated in several music festivals and recitals. She loves reading and anything creative. She's a natural leader, loves her bunny. So tonight we welcome Brianna Werhun. So it's all yours. second you gotta stay here <laughs> holy smokes listen first i want to say outstanding for a grade five voice it's a very mature voice and i was wondering those high notes i was waiting for some of the glasses to start breaking that was amazing <laughs> so i want to say on behalf of city council all of our guests and everybody at home that's watching you did a great job we know it's really hard mm -hmm. in front of a live audience it puts a lot of butterflies in your belly but you did it like a champ so i just want to say great job and there's a bright future for you thank you okay great job thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Now next on our agenda, if I could um, draw your attention, just give me half a second here. Draw your attention to the screens. We'll have our land acknowledgement and traditional indigenous meeting opening. With the aim of educating our community, I'd like to invite Elder Jackie Labonte, traditional knowledge keeper and local member of the Haudenosaunee to join us once again to share her testimony as we acknowledge and thank the indigenous peoples who are stewards of this land for a millennia before us. 
Sego, thank you. I just want to um, add a little bit more to the land acknowledgement that has been acknowledged here, especially in the city of Niagara Falls in moving forward to build those relationships with our indigenous population here. And I think one of the, um, one of the strong elements that is recognized is um, the dish with one spoon. And that encompasses um, kind of like a, a treaty or an agreement between nations even to utilize a space, a common space, so that you're not going to deplete what's there, that we're able to all come together and utilize what we need to for our well-being and to still have some resources left. And I think one of the things that um, showed this, for me anyway, in, in our ceremonies, is that we recognize that the strawberry is the le leader amongst all of the plants. And we have a ceremony for the strawberry, but also that strawberry drink is at the other ceremonies. And so for us, um, they have the, um, the benches there for the singers and the drummers, and a drink is prepared, that strawberry drink and is brought in and put on the bench. It's just one pail and one dipper. And so anytime that anyone is thirsty, needs a drink to quench their thirst, then they can just come up to that pail and use that dipper and take a drink. And you're just quenching your thirst for that moment and anyone else can do the same. Everybody has a responsibility to bring, say, some of those berries. We don't leave it all to one person. That'd be a pretty big job because we have sometimes 200, 300 people at our ceremonies. And if it were left to one person, that's a huge job. So our job is to help with that responsibility. Everybody brings some berries to help make that juice so that it can be dispersed to everyone around there. And so we recognize that that dish with one spoon is that concept and it's, it's been here for hundreds and hundreds of years with our people. And so in moving forward, we see that in different aspects within our communities. And so we recognize and honor that, that this is being embraced, that this is a part of the history, part of the teaching, part of the learning that's happening in our communities to build that bridge. And I can see that the city of Niagara Falls has helped to build those bridges, changing those lights in the falls to orange, helping our indigenous populations in and around our, this area. And so we recognize and offer that gratitude that this is happening, that it's continuing, and we look for further togetherness with that. Yeah. Thank you to Jackie Labonte. We're grateful for the land that we shared together. Now, moving along our agenda, next item are the adoption of the minutes from the February 7th meeting. Looking for a motion, for, a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Baldinelli that we approve the minutes. All those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous. Thank you for that. Do we have any disclosures of pecuniary interest? No, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. 7.6, which is PBD 2023-12, and the corresponding bylaw 2023-13, my primary residence is within the notification zone, and also the Bill 23 items, my family owns property that can be affected. Those fall under 5.2 and 10.2. I'll give this to the clerk. Okay, thank you for that. And Councillor Peter Angel will hand in his disclosures of a pecuniary interest to the clerk. And there are no more, then we will move along um, to the mayor's reports and announcements. Of course, it's everybody's favorite time of the agenda, and that's why our MPP Gates is here. He came early so he could, uh, he could hear them. So I won't try not to let him down. Uh, first off with obituaries. Barbara Standrick, mother of David Stevens of our municipal department passed away. Norm Puttick, former city and regional councillor, 41 years as city alderman and regional councillor. So great many years, 
has passed on and uh, we were with his family at a celebration of life on the weekend so it was nice to uh, see him at Patterson Funeral Home and to see all the newspaper clippings and how things have changed over the years. Wow, things have uh, changed. Saw Councillor Thompson in some of those pictures without a mustache. I didn't, I didn't even know it was him. He looks completely different. You wouldn't recognize, I didn't think it was him. If, we hadn't, uh, if it hadn't been pointed out to me, I wouldn't have believed it. Also, um, Richard Winger, retired district chief of station five, volunteer station five for almost 33 years, retired in February of 2014 as their district chief. City Council representatives, we thank Councillor Peter Angelo representing the city at the Niagara District Firefighters Association meeting. Uh, if you look to the screens for Rotia, Rotaria, Rotary Trivia Night, uh, that was our team. Uh, we didn't do that great. Um, we, uh, <laughs> but uh, hold on, you guys are you're ahead of me here. Um, we're, it was also, we were joined by Councillor, well, Councillor Patel put the table together and uh, Councillor Neustag and Peter Angelo was there as well as myself. I might have contributed half of one answer, I'm not really sure, but uh, we didn't do all that well, but we had fun, we had fun. Pardon me? Okay, thank you. And, uh, and I ate some chips, so I mean, you know, I contributed things. Uh, candlelight Vigil, that was the next picture. Uh, we just had that, I was joined by Councillors Neustag, Patel, and of course, our MPP, Wayne Gates, was there as well as we acknowledged one year of the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. So we turned the falls blue and yellow, and we had a lot of people there and standing strong. And it was on that exact very spot. Three and a half years ago, Vladimir Zelensky was there with his wife, Olena, uh, as we were admiring the falls. And of course, that was before all this war began. And so here we are, three and a half years later, uh, acknowledging one year of this terrible war. So uh, next up, I'd like to acknowledge Rich Merlino, uh, one of our community people who is something else. He has just run his 1,000th consecutive run for Julianne Misk, um, and, and he did it on vacation. So all of his runs are 5K in honor of Julianne, of course, who passed away and who I know um, was very close also with Councillor Strange and Councillor Peter Angelo, and Councillor Peter, Peter Angelo taught her as well and ran with her. Uh, in some of her races. This morning, Julianne's par parents, Bernadette and Joe, along with Councillor Strange and Councillor Peter Angelo, and of course, Rich Merlino himself, completed the run together from Betty's Restaurant down to the falls in Dufferin Islands in memory of Julianne. And you can see them there on the road doing the run. Your TV coverage on Kojiko will air on Saturday, March the 4th at 4 p.m. And there's the bike that uh, Joe, her dad, used to ride with her and the cancer ride, the, the big ride, uh, to conquer cancer, yep. And um, they would ride that tandem bike together. Donations of, and, and if you wanna speak after, I've got one more sentence here. Don donations of support can be made to help build the Children's Memorial Parkway at Fireman's Park. So we're building a memorial parkway. You'll see all the construction right at the gateway of uh, Fireman's Park and Councillor Strange and Peter Angelo brought this idea for it a couple of years ago for anyone who's lost a child. You know, it doesn't matter what age, that this is a place you can reflect, you know, place rocks, go for walks, um, butterfly gardens, all sorts of beautiful things that'll happen at the corner of Fireman's Park. And if you'd like to donate, just get in touch with our office. We'd be happy to help you out. Checks are currently being accepted and online donations are accepted as well. I don't know if Councillor uh, Peter Angelo, Councillor Strange, you wanted to chat at all about uh, Julianne or The Run or Rich Merlino? Well, um, sure, Your Worship. I mean, there's a lot that I could say about Julianne, um, definitely. I mean, I always say that, you know, her heart was uh, bigger than her body, really. I mean, she was a really small person uh, to begin with, and I always wondered how big, how that big heart actually fit into her body. And she had a fighting spirit. Actually, at school, we still give out an annual award at graduation, and we call it the Fighting Spirit Award. And it's the fighting spirit in honor of Julianne Miss because she just had that in, in her. She was a great competitor. She was also a great person. She used to reach out to you uh, when you were going through your cancer. Uh, anyone who was going through cancer at the time that she knew, she was always texting them and asking them how they were doing as opposed to how she was doing. She was just that type of person. The one thing I did want to mention in regards to donations is that right now um, it would be nice to have a city web page that we can uh, direct people to where they can go and make th their own online donation with their credit card. Right now, I think we're only accepting checks. So perhaps we can have okay. staff 
uh, create something so that people can go there and make an online donation, and then that will automatically go to the memorial gardens that are at the Fireman's Park portion. Thanks. Well, that's great. Maybe uh, as a direction, can we take that as direction to staff um, to have an online don donation thing on our website? Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Councillor Strange? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, and, and I just want to uh, thank Rich Merlin Merlino for, for doing this run, and I th he started off with uh, 100 days, and, um, yeah. Julian actually passed away the 50th day that he was doing one of these runs and he continued it to a thousand days, which is just incredible because I know you feel like you get up in the morning, you want to eat, sometimes you don't feel because of the weather, especially this morning, rain, sleet, whatever, he got up and he ran and even when he was on vacation. And that was the thing about Julianne. She loved running in the rain, she loved all the, all the elements that she could run and she didn't care, she thought it was fun and she laughed, she loved going out and challenging herself. So it was just amazing and it was kind of, kind of ironic that his final, the thousands run, he ran at the, at the brink of the falls where we had the illumination for uh, Julianne on, on, the, on her celebration of her passing. And then we put out little hearts on each spot. So one was there and then one we went to Dufferin Islands where she, where she colored rocks and, and did butterfly pictures on stones and, and uh, put them in Dufferin Islands. And then we went to the start of the, the just the bridge, the Whitman Bridge, um, and we put a heart there because when you think of Chippewa, you think of Julianne, and Julianne is Chippewa. And then we went over to Sacred Heart, her elementary school, and then finally over to, uh, to Betty's, where you can still do uh, donations. They have trees. They just did the Valentine's tree, and they put donations on, and there's tons of cards, and they're still uh, doing unbelievable, great causes towards different charities, and I know St. Patrick's coming up. So just a great tribute um, to such an inspirational young woman who, uh, who went far before she should have. And uh, we think of her often. I think, you know, the donations to this legacy trail for her, the Memorial Garden, and, and, uh, and, and giving it to children who have passed that shouldn't have. They, they you know, it's never one's, uh, a, a parent should, a, a child should never pass before their parents. And uh, we see that uh, too much, and especially in cancer, which uh, Julianne went through. So we want to really keep her legacy along with Alex Louie and, and for the start of that legacy trail. So the donation page would be amazing to, uh, to keep this going. Thank you. That's great, thank you for that. Uh, continue, continuing on, uh, this weekend we did have the grand opening of the OLG stage at the Falls View Casino. Uh, big, big day as we feature Billy Joel as the opening act <coughs> and he was able to also hit the high notes similar to our singer tonight, uh, maybe not quite as high. 5,000 seats, no seat more than 150 feet from the stage. I know uh, all of council was there, our MPP was there. Um, it, every seat was great, sight lines, they've got the uh, sawtooth seating, so it's <coughs> gradual with offset uh, chairs, so nobody's big head is in front of you blocking the view. So everyone's got a clear view, and they tell me, it's just as exciting for the performer as it is for the spectators. <coughs> they love performing there. And it's just a thrill to see, and what a way, this was the buzz all across Toronto, everyone was talking about this. It's his <coughs> only performance in Canada, and he hasn't played in Canada in several years. So it was a big deal to get the piano man here to Niagara Falls. And the other part I found really quite interesting is that his parents <coughs> had their honeymoon in Niagara Falls. That was really interesting, you know? And it's amazing how many people have come here for their, for their honeymoon, so. Uh, Wayne Thompson was the mayor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wayne Thompson was the mayor at the time, exactly, so. Uh, <laughs> Without his mustache, I think, yeah. So this, and again, this was 12 years in the making. It was, and the irony, here's the irony. At the time, Deloitte did a feasibility study on the idea of a five <coughs> to 7,000 seat theater, and the person who was commissioned to do that for Deloitte was our CAO, Jason Burgess. The irony, and come forward 12 years, and he's actually the CAO. It's kind of interesting how it happened. Um, also, it, uh, you know, council, all of council joined us that night. It was a big <coughs> success. So thank you to everybody for being there. The beginning of so many great things to come for the city. It's gonna be super. What I really like, a lot of the mom and pop restaurants were busy. There was buzz, buzz everywhere in the city. For February, I'll take it. Next council meeting will be Tuesday, March the 21st. So what we're gonna do now, um, I'm gonna ask our clerk. So we do, we've got presentations and then we've got some a little bit of homework that council has to do tonight. So I'm gonna, uh, yes, uh, Councilor Strange. Mr. Mayor, before we, we go on to the, the, the committees. Um, We're not gonna do that quite yet. We're gonna I just do wanted, wanted oh. to make a motion to 
um, because there are, are, are there was a large amount. Um, Can we save that just for a bit? Because I'm going to take that's a great motion. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this, but if we we'll wait, we're not going to actually do committees yet. I just talked to the clerk, and we thought we'd turn around, so we're not going to make these guys wait okay. while we do this, if that's okay, yeah. and then we'll come back to it, Mr. Clerk. So to echo what the mayor was just speaking about, uh, instead of uh, speaking about. 5.1, which is the appointments of various committees and commissions. Uh, that was really just me going to introduce and open up the voting on that. Uh, we are going to jump to 5.2 on the agenda, uh, which is uh, having MPP Wayne Gates um, uh, speak, and then we will follow the agenda from there. When we get through our uh, presentations, uh, we'll go back and speak about the appointments to various boards, uh, committees, etc. Uh, so we're going to move ahead to uh, 5.2 on the agenda. Okay, thank you for that. 5.2. Okay, so we're going to welcome up our MPP Wayne Gates and Owen Bjorgen wish to raise their concerns about the Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act. So, welcome. Welcome. Thank Thanks, Jim, for inviting us here. I'm, I'm very excited. As you all know, I've sat around this uh, horseshoe more many, many times. So I'm gonna let Owen start and then I'll uh, do the rest of the presentation. On that note, um, I'd like to thank Wayne Gates for having me here today by your side. It's an honor to present beside you on such an important and pertinent issue. I'd like to thank Mayor Jim and the rest of uh, City Council for this evening and staff um, for having me here as well. Likewise, it has been uh, many years since I have stood in this exact spot in council. Um, I'm grateful to be back, so thank you on that note. So I'd like to start this conversation by saying um, it's almost a shame that I have only a few minutes to talk about something that is going to impact Ontarians for more than a few generations. Um, so a bit about myself as Owen Bjorgen. Uh, my, ba my background is a Bachelor of Science in Biodiversity, <laughs> which literally just translates to the diversity of life. Um, and that's where I studied at the University of Guelph. But I took a lot of my studies back down to my home turf here in Niagara Region as a Niagara local. I also work with the Niagara District School Board as an outdoor educator. And that gave me a lot of pause for thought this morning because you wouldn't guess it by rare suit and tie version of myself. I was actually in stinky muddy boots and far from dress apparel just moments ago as I was out with 22 grade five, six students. What that job is important to me for is it allows time to pause and reflect because I'm watching these children, the next generation, engaging with an area that funny enough is part of our green belt the next generation right beneath our own feet here and the decisions that we may make or may not make as a city council. Next slide, please. And you might be thinking it's not just the next generation that I think we should all inherently care for from a human stance, but we also need to look at what we have here in our backyard right on the Niagara Peninsula. And one of my most essential talking points on my private hiking tours with students at school and here this evening in the city chamber is how we live in the Amazon of Canada, and a lot of people, even as locals, let alone elected officials, are not aware of that. So that's what I'm here to briefly educate us about today, and hopefully it will inspire us to act accordingly with the face of Bill 23. So that little green shaded area on that map, if it's hard to see, that is the whole point. It is that tiny of an area. It's less than 1% of Canada's land mass, and that light shaded green area in the extreme south of Ontario, if we could zoom in on the next slide, please. There we are. I've highlighted it in that same color of green. That little area, again, less than 1% of Canada's landmass has about a quarter of Canada's human population in there. And that is for all of the right reasons. We have some of the most arable land, not just in Canada, but therefore in all of North America. And we also, in that shaded green area, have the Carolinian forest zone, the most species rich eco-region of the entire country. Yes, that's right, all of Canada. The Yukon is wilder, Northern Ontario is wilder, of course, in terms of space and wilderness, but as far as species richness goes, that little green area right there in our backyard here in Niagara Falls is as good as it gets. The most biodiverse region, look at some of those stats. A third of Canada's rare and endangered species reside in that green area, and again, a quarter, therefore, of Canada's species at risk as labeled. Next slide, please. I love this satellite image of the Niagara region because it's a mosaic. You can see the gray areas, which of course denote our urban areas. And we've got Hamilton on the top left, working way around accordingly, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, Welland, Port Colborne, et cetera. With Bill 23 at the doorstep, 
there will be a lot more doorsteps very quickly in the Niagara region. Those gray areas are going to grow and radiate out. And I'd like to put on the table right now the idea that I myself and Mr. Gates here, we are not anti-development. That is an unreasonable stance to take. We are not trying to shut development projects down. The essence of this conversation and my professional background is to do it more wisely and do it smart. So in this mosaic area, again, we have our urban areas, our agriculture, and our natural heritage areas. Those natural heritage areas and our agriculture are largely lumped into that once protected special area, only recently and formerly, the green belt. Next slide, please. So again, if you look at Niagara here, it's all about numbers. There's a lot of people that are living on the Niagara Peninsula and we are all aware that there is going to be population growth and there are even quotas for population growth, growth based on which region we're in in Ontario. I've discussed what the Carolinian forest is, but just to kind of add a bit of oomph to it, we've got the types of forests and wetlands that are more typically found down in North and South Carolina, and they are at their northernmost limit here, and I don't care how much any of us complain about winter, we have it easy in Southern Ontario, and that's why so many species can live this far north. The moment you drive half an hour north of this exact spot, this special place, you lose that species richness. How are we, and how are you as a city council going to choose to protect it? Next slide, please. So just a couple quick slides here on, on the lighter note, the beauty that is with us too. In the day and age of mental and of course biological health being at the forefront of so many political conversations, and rightfully so, given everything we've just been through as a society, we need our natural green spaces as much as the rare species need them. So whether it's going for a jog in your local conservation area or forest and admiring the beautiful farmlands beside it, or taking your kid down to fish at the creek and say, hey, you can swim here. Don't worry, this water is still fresh and clean enough. These things matter. As much as it matters for the two species of salamanders you may or may not be able to see in that photo that cling to the walls of the Niagara Gorge that are found nowhere else in the province. There is a lot of value here for culture and biodiversity alike. Next slide, please. We have waterfalls in the Niagara region, for example, that a lot of people don't even know about and don't even have names. And even areas out of sight and out of mind like this will be impacted by the effects of Bill 23, which I'll unpack in a few slides. Next slide, please. So we've got our blue-spotted salamander there, and we've got our trumpet lichens on the left. I will not bore you with the details of why each one is specifically interesting to me or to the biological community, but we've had this conversation in this chamber before, years ago, why should you care about the blue-spotted salamander or the lichens or this rare species of tree? Because if I were to come by your driveway once a night sneakily and just, oops, remove a bolt here, oops, cut a wire here, oops, the next night I remove another bolt over here, you may not notice the little differences and then one day your car is not going to start. What does that look like for society here in southern Ontario when we remove the green belt protections? Next slide, please. If we pick away at the little bits and pieces we have remaining, which by the way on the Niagara Peninsula is about 10% of original forest and wetland coverage like you see here in Niagara Falls remaining. I always use this analogy with the students at school, but I think it's applicable on an adult scale today. I have a 10 slice pizza, we're down to one. We better have a very, very good conversation about what happens to that last slice of pizza. The problem with what happened with Bill 23 is there was zero conversation about it. That to me is seriously problematic from both a logistical sense, which Wayne will unpack later, but also from the fact that it creates an unfair fight for our environment and our ecosystems. So I'm gonna challenge city council here tonight. Are you gonna be a bystander on an unfair fight? Next slide, please. I love this photo because it sums up Niagara to me. You've got some visitors here. They happen to be on one of my private hiking tours and they are enjoying some of our very fine wine and there's some forest protected on the escarpment in the background. Oh, until it wasn't protected anymore, thanks to the green belt's current removal. So this is problematic because we have so many people who come to Niagara region every year and the eyeballs are on us. They're on Niagara Falls as an international stage. They're on mm -hmm. Niagara and the Lake where we're going next this evening. So Niagara Falls does a fantastic job at leading by example in terms of showcasing what's important around here such as our tourism you know, qualities, 
our aesthetics, the falls itself, the whining, the dining, the theater, the entertainment. We do an excellent job at all of that. Why wouldn't we also want to celebrate and even flaunt our environmental protections? Will we do that? So these kind of questions here are why we're here this evening. These are more questions to kind of ponder amongst yourselves and discuss, but again, how could your municipality right here in Niagara Falls in your backyard be directly or indirectly impacted? I'm gonna quickly unpack that one on the final slide. What are the cultural and local barriers that exist to taking action? Well now to me this seems to come down to a matter of willpower. The legislation is through, the fight is on. Who is willing in this chamber and elsewhere to stick up for this whole situation and say, you know what, I believe the most arable land in North America nearly and the most biodiverse region of Canada deserves a little bit more protection. So why should we bother to care? Even if you don't care about the blue spotted salamander, you should care as a municipality because the amount of ecosystem services in terms of dollar signs that these places bring to us in terms of our agricultural goods, the cooling of our cities, flood prevention, erosion protection, the stability of our agricultural soils, that is all thanks to none other than the Green Belt. And we should remind ourselves that the Green Belt was actually made, to be honest, I don't know the exact year it was coined, but when it was created, it was under the effect of, this is the cream of the crop of what we've got left, let's protect it. So when the Ford government says, don't worry, we're just gonna put acres and acres of it over here and reassign the Green Belt, I encourage you all tonight to not confuse quality for quantity, because in this case, they're not comparable. Next slide, please. So again, I, uh, for a little bit of light humor on a very serious subject, I always say a belt is something that hold, a belt holds things up to avoid embarrassing and avoidable consequences. So that's why it was called the Green Belt. With the protections being removed, we must say once again that myself and Mr. Gates here are not anti-development. It's a matter of where and how you place these developments. I mean, if the rules can be changed with the snap of a finger, as we've seen recently, why can't we change the rules with the snap of another finger and say, we're going to take the higher road and develop here, change some zoning here for the sake of protecting our natural heritage of farmlands. As I mentioned, your municipality can lead by example and celebrate. There are millions of dollars of flood control, soil stability, urban cooling, and carbon sequestration in a day and age of climate change. And something occurred to me when we think, if we continue to gobble up our farmland because of the Greenbelt protections being removed, what happens next is our food prices are going to go up more than they already are, and we are going to start looking internationally and over borders for areas to look for our food. That is going to get more expensive for the consumer, which is no good. And it's also going to add to the global climate change crisis as we ship things in from further locations. This is all related. It's all ripple effect. So decisions made now are going to impact full circle, as I said, not just the species that live here and call it home. We are one of those species, and it will impact us for generations alike. Next slide, please. So before I say my official thank you, I just wanted to remind everybody that years ago when I stood in this exact spot, myself and others were labeled and put into a box as, quote, a special interest group by people in this room today. I never knew that protecting the environment was considered a special interest, but we all know with Bill 23, the tables have turned, and the real special interest group are the few entities, corporations, and developers that are going to make a quick buck at the expense of Ontarians and our biodiversity. They're the special interest group. Thank you, City Council. Thank you, Mr. Yogan. Any questions of Council? Well, I, Jim, I'm still going to speak. Uh, okay, so you don't want questions at this point? No, I think we'll wait it till the end, and okay. then we can do that. Sounds uh, good. Thank you very much. Sounds I appreciate that. Uh, just being mindful of the time. It originally yeah, was for I'm going as quick as more. I'll go as quick as okay. I can. Okay. Thank I you. I uh, I do want to say that isn't it nice to listen to somebody as young as this gentleman talk about protecting our environment? I will say that. Thank you for having me here today, and allowing me to provide this presentation on Bill 23. Let me start by saying this: housing affordability is an issue. No one disagrees with that. It is a crisis right across the province of Ontario. I support building homes, and particularly affordable housing, but I do not support building on our green belt and environmentally significant lands. And I don't support a plan that lacks consultation and will download costs onto municipalities. There are serious concerns with Bill 23. There are significant financial concerns for municipalities. 
the potential destruction of our green belt, and ultimately, we're not positive that Bill 23 will even achieve the goal to reduce the cost of housing. Your own staff report, which I want to compliment, did an incredible job on the staff report that was presented to you, I believe, on October 22nd. From a provincial perspective, our job is to support you. We should be working to support municipalities, not downing, downloading problems and costs onto your shoulders. And supporting municipalities includes listening. Many municipalities that came forward were strong in their language. And I'm going to quote from the City of St. Catharines. The bill threatens the foundation of planning and community building further and generates conflict and division in the process when it's critical that all levels work together. Should the bill be passed, which it has as proposed, it will have negative impact to the environment, social and economical health, and the well-being of our communities, setting the city back instead of progressing forward. It's not a small criticism, and the feedback should mean something. But with this government, it must, must be continued. I truly believe that if municipalities across the province of Ontario continue to stand up and communicate their concerns on Bill 23, this government may change course. They've done it before. Today, I want to briefly highlight three primary concerns. The financial reality of Bill 23, protecting our green space, and what we can do to tackle our housing crisis. The staff report put forward by the City of Niagara Falls is clear. This legislation will mean a significant loss in income and potentially increase to the cost of taxpayers. That's not coming from Wayne Gates, that's coming from your own report. The loss of de development fees, along with staffing challenges created by the legislation, will have a ne negative financial impact. We're unfortunately witnessed the harsh reality of these financial impacts with significant property tax increases. As your staff report noted, this is a departure from the principles that growth is to pay for itself. We have also significant concerns with the protection of our green belt. Remember this, when you pave over the environmental significant lands, they're gone forever. You don't get them back. You, it's, there's no going back. The province-owned task force, and this is important, on a housing affordability said that a shortage of land is not the issue. They went so far as to say that the green belt along with the envir environmentally significant areas of, and farms, must be protected. Your own staff report noted that the de de decrease of parkland availability to an increasing dense neighborhood can reduce the quality of life right here in Niagara Falls. The message is clear. Green space is important to the health of our community right here in Niagara Falls. I appreciate the details that Owen was able to provide on the protecting our environment, environment here in Niagara. It is of vital importance. We can develop and build 1.5 million new homes without touching our green belt. Ultimately, this legislation must, must be a concern because it's a Hail Mary attempt to fix a generation of crisis. It's based on an idea that deregulation and tax cuts will spur enough development to lower prices. But there's little, I mean little evidence to even support that. True government investment has the power to create affordable housing alongside supporting municipalities, not hurting them financially. And with this little consultation and actual bills, the refusal to listen to the issues presented by AMO. Think about that. They wouldn't even talk to AMO, who represents 444 municipalities in the province of Ontario. They're able to put in a written report. How can we stand by and really believe this is the best solution to such a large problem? The advocacy that was started, the conversations that we've had can't end because the legislation has passed. However, and this is important to the mayor and to the council, we need to work together to heighten the awareness and the concerns with the ultimate goal of convincing this government that direction needs to change. We need to protect our green belt. I hope that the information and concerns provided are useful and that we can find productive ways going forward to push the government in the right direction and continue to work together for the betterment of the residents of Niagara Falls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne. So now, how long do we have? Uh, 
all these rookie mistakes. Uh, thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Uh, appreciate what did you say? I missed it. Sorry. No, I said rookie mistake. Oh. That's what I said. Um, uh, thank you, Wayne, and thank you to Owen. Very passionate and well-spoken. Uh, appreciate that. So now, Council, this is your chance if you have any questions or comments of our presenters. Council Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the Mayor to our speaker, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us your specific concerns regarding the lack of consultation and the impact that it's going to have on our municipality. Yeah, I appreciate the question, uh, Councillor. The bill is a very big bill. So obviously in the 10 minutes, I think we went over a little bit and we apologize for that, Jim. But at the end of the day, it's an important bill. Uh, so it is a very big bill. And normally what happens, it would come come to uh, the ledge, we would send it to uh, second reading, and then it go to committee. In this case, it went to committee with very limited uh, people allowing to present, and I already give you an example with Emil, who was denied the opportunity to present on behalf of 444 municipalities in the province of Ontario. And normally with a bill like this, something that's important as this, it would go around to communities. So it would come maybe to Niagara Falls, it might go to Toronto, it might go to Windsor, it might go to Lynn. None of that happened with this bill. None of that consultation was done. And then it was brought back for third reading. We had our six hours of debate, and then it was passed. Uh, a bill like this should have went through committee, should have allowed AMO, I, just, it just, I don't even understand why they didn't allow AMO to speak, uh, and go to, from community to community. Because like I said in my presentation, like Owen has said in his presentation, when we lose the green belt, there's no going back. It's gone, it's gone forever. And the benefits of the green belt, to protecting our water, our air, is so important. Uh, so this is why I'm coming to council. I'm, I'm saying I want to work with the council. I want to work, I'm going to Niagara Lake after this. I'm going to Fort Erie in a, in a few weeks. I want to make sure that we do everything we can to protect the green belt. And I've already said in this presentation, I'll say it again, there is enough land today, as I'm standing here, to build two million homes in the province of Ontario in the next 10 years. Two million. We do not have to touch the green belt. That's the issue with me, lack of consultation and the fact of the green belt. And then for the council, I think, and you know, you guys can have that discussion yourselves. I believe the financial hardship that it may cause councils right across the province of Ontario is so important to why Bill 23 can't work. Because at the end of the day, if the hardship becomes, including staffing issues that the city may have to, because of how, bill, how the bill been, has been, uh, been done, it may, you may have to have hire more staff because the time limits are so quick. So I'm saying to you, um, it's gonna hurt. And when that happens, who's gonna have to pay? It's gonna be the taxpayer. And you know what, there's only one taxpayer. You know, there's not a, a group of taxpayers, there's one. And that's my concern and it should be the concern for this council. And what I'm saying here, the reason why I'm here, I wanna work with the council, uh, but I wanna be very clear on my position. We cannot uh, destroy the green belt. Uh, we have the land that we can build two million homes, not 1.5 over 10 years. I believe we should build the homes. I believe it should be done with local tradespeople. You know, I always believe in that, local workers and local companies. All that stuff can be done without touching our green belt. And that's why I asked Owen to come, who I think is a lot more, has a lot more knowledge than I do on, on, this, uh, on the green belt and some of the things that why we need the green belt to protect. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have one more follow-up question for Mr. Gates, and then I have one question for um, Mr. Bjorgen, if that's okay. Um, the follow-up question is, do you, do you believe that the provincial government should support the municipalities financially because of the changes of Bill 23? Well, that's a really good question, because that's really what my big concern is, is that absolutely the uh, provincial government should be supporting municipalities, not just Niagara Falls, but every municipality that is facing financial hardships in the province of Ontario, uh, without a doubt. And I would think, and you know, the, certainly the mayor and uh, the CEO could correct me, I would think that they've probably already sent letters or asked the, municip uh, asked the province, what are you going to do because it's going to hurt us financially? And at the end of the day, like I, I said, we just saw our taxes go up, whether it be the region or the city, uh, the taxes are going to go up if, if we don't get help from other levels of government, whether it be provincial or federally. They have to protect municipalities. Okay, thank you. Through the mayor um, to Mr. Bjorgen, my question is, um, you've touched a little bit on about how Niagara is different than the rest of the province. Um, could you 
go into a little bit more detail about how unique Niagara is compared to the rest of the province and why we have to be so diligent about this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. And, and, and again, as I mentioned in the slideshow, it's, it's everything to do with that critically important but powerful area in a small region of Canada, so less than 1%, and that's where we house the highest biodiversity of, of the country, not just the province, but the whole country. Um, so just to kind of rattle a few stats off, you know, fun facts of the night, but 70 species, for example, of tree are listed on the Niagara Peninsula. That's just about a Niagara, sorry, national high on that note. Um, same goes for birds. We have over 400 species logged along the Niagara River corridor right next to our chamber here alone. Uh, reptiles and amphibians are at a national high. Same goes for insects, plant life, everything. So you have all these nationally high scores condensed into one small area. So small but mighty is a term I like to use to describe the Niagara region as a part of the Carolinian forest zone. Um, our forests are aesthetically and biologically unlike anything once you drive north of even just Hamilton, let alone for the rest of the nation. And I like to kind of think that there's an opportunity in Niagara region for things such as ecotourism, the benefits of mental and physical health by people getting outside to experience these forests. It's amazing how many people can live in Niagara or visit it and then walk away or move away per se and not know that they were in such a special region of the country. Um, so I think it's just really important to reiterate how fragile an ecosystem is because when it's down to its final 10% of remaining parts, I'm a firm believer that, you know, preservation is a strong word. Preservation is up here, which means lock it up. Conservation is a step down, which means work with it and work around it. There is a time and place for preservation. And when we consider the Carolinian forest zone in Niagara, as Mr. Gates was just discussing, these houses can fit somewhere. We got to be very careful about where and how we fit them, though. I think that's the most important thing to know about this region. It's, it's very special. Um, it's a gem in Canada. Not a lot of people know about it, and it deserves to be brought to the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks okay, for the thank questions. You. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, do we have any uh, Councillor Strange? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. And, and Owen, I, I see him on the, the trails quite a bit with uh, Councillor Peter Andrew and I know you got such a special passion. So we really, really appreciate it. You know, me, I'm in a, a real estate background, and we realize the pressure on what we need in housing in the next decade. I know just from uh, you know, the feds, just from immigration, we're bringing in 465,000 residents in 2023, 485,000 in 2024, and 500,000 in 2025. Um, <coughs> CMHC uh, forecast we need 5.8 million homes by the end of the decade, which is, which is pretty crazy. Um, we need 1.5 million, as, as Mr. Gates knows, in, in, uh, in the province. We voted, actually, last year to extend the urban boundary because a lot of the times we didn't people like okay we want it to intensify but we don't we don't want it like Toronto here either. we don't and that was a lot of and I know a council Coco voted against that but that's one of the things too people either they want more homes but they don't want to move up so there's no other choice but to extend their boundary sometimes and without that I don't know how you build this amount of homes uh, in the province we're in trouble and I know you know with, with uh, the prices are going down, but the mortgage rates are going up. If the mortgage rates stayed where they were last year and, and the prices came down, people would be able to afford housing, but they can't. And we're, we're in big trouble. I don't know affordability. What is affordable for a family now? What is the price? No one can answer that. I don't think anyone can answer that. All I know is that we need more homes. I agree with, with, with the part with develop, losing money on the development charge and we have to come back and we have to do something about that, but the homes we need, we need these homes coming up. So if there's an answer someone can give us to, to produce these homes without um, uh, going into our green belt and uh, extending the urban boundary, I all agree with them. Well, I, uh, I'll, can I just respond yeah, just yeah, quickly to them? Uh, we, we can build all the homes we need without touching the green belt. That's, how, that's, that's really my key message. But I'll try and help you with the definition of affordable housing under the legislation is as being a rental unit where the rent is no greater than 80% of the average of the market rent or a non rental unit where the home was sold at no greater than 80% of the average person purchasing price. So that's the definition, although it's broad, but that's the definition of, of uh, affordable housing. And as we know, how many people can afford $480,000, whatever the number is, but that's the definition 
Um, I can I can send that to you, uh, Councillor Strange. If no, you'd I, like. I appreciate that, and and that's the one thing because we don't know the actual number, you know. And I'm worried about our kids. is is the most important thing. The more houses we build, the price are going to come down. It's supply and demand. It's it's it's, it's as easy as that. And I don't know the number, but I'm worried about our future. I'm worried about our kids not being able to afford a house. And we see the forecast, we need 5. million homes in Canada in the next decade. It's just insane. And where do you put them? They don't, they're not going to Labrador. They all want to come down to Southern Ontario. Uh, okay. okay, yeah, did you want to say something? Yeah, just a quick comment on that. Even just regarding like a Niagara Falls context on, because I totally understand the pressure of, you know, there's only a limited amount of space, the population, quota and pressure is, is immense and intense and so there's the sort of invitation to radiate out the urban boundary and whatnot and going back to my point of you know it's not how you build it perhaps where even just driving here my drive to get here there are so many places within the boundaries the urban boundaries of Niagara Falls for example that have large dilapidated falling apart structures that are no longer in use I know this doesn't solve the entire problem for Ontario and the Greenbelt at this rate there are brown fields, which are basically farmer's fields that have been kind of let go, yep. usually clogged up with invasive species that have made themselves at home there. Those are the two big kind of property types that come to mind. This will not solve the entire crisis that you're explaining very clearly, but even as a municipality here in Niagara Falls, look at those properties. They're sitting and literally doing nothing, and they're sometimes within your urban boundary. Maybe lead by example at the local scale, look at ways you can develop there, and you don't have to radiate out as much, per se. And, and to that yeah. point, sorry, yeah, we, that was actually last, was it last council meeting or, or the council meeting before we talked about zombie homes and stuff like that. So we're getting on that and, and it, it's a good point and it's a point that we, we addressed a couple council meetings ago. Thank you. And to be clear, Labrador is a nice place. I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear. Canada is a great place. There's great lots place. of room. Best country in the world. I just want to be clear. I don't want to get a call from, the, from Labrador now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll find out though. Councillor Strange, or Councillor Thompson, sorry. Strange. <laughs> well, must have yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, we've been here a long time, and when you talk about wetlands and the environment, um, that's something we live with for years, and we still. Um, feel uh, that uh, concerns. And they're talking about uh, building thousands and millions of houses. And at the same time, in our agenda tonight, we're talking about development charges for a fire pump truck um, and uh, the part of the 23 uh, and is uh, suggesting no um, development charges. How could we ever do this? And is that um, as part of your um, concerns? Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Thompson. Yes, I think I've already said it in my presentation uh, that that is one of the things that I think we have to go to the provincial and federal governments to make sure that the hardships on municipality isn't financial. And I think the one line that I use here that uh, development pays for development. I mean, that's always been around this, this horseshoe. Uh, you've been here for, I you know, 30 years, 40 years, whatever it is. When I was here for the four years, that was always 15. longer, longer, okay. I was giving yeah. him a compliment, he looked so good. Well, so the Mayor there Thompson you go. But, but at the end of, end, end of the day, uh, yeah, if you can't collect uh, DC charges, Somebody's going to have to pay for the services. You've still got all the responsibilities the, of the city, and that will be taxpayers. May. And that's a great comment, Wayne. Concern. Yes, yeah. great comment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do, yes, Councillor Campbell. Just while we're uh, speaking about taxpayers, there's a lot of seniors that can just barely get by with the income that they have uh, through their savings and such. And if this development charges thing doesn't get worked out, taxes are going to go up, mm -hmm. and yeah, there'll be affordable housing because the seniors are going to have to move out of their houses, and uh, we can't have that happen. Yeah, 
appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Patel. Good comments, Wayne. Uh, great Councilor, uh, presentation. Uh, about the development charges, I think it only affects the houses, those are registered with the region as uh, affordable housing. It doesn't affect all the developments, it's only a few, uh, very less percent of the housing that affects. And I think the financial burden is not going to be as large as we think on the municipalities. And we are asking pro provincial or federal government to make it whole. End of the day, it's just the one taxpayer. Even if it's provincial government pays, pays it back to municipality or federal government pays back to the municipality. It's all coming from the same wallet. So I think what I actually do agree with this direction that the provincial government is going, especially for development charges, because if you're paying less for the housing, then saving gets passed on to the consumer. And that's only for affordable housing. Not for all the other developments, I'm talking about only the affordable housing. And uh, maybe Mr. Bryce can elaborate on that. But there is only a certain number of the houses that's affected by the development charges, right? Mr. Mr. Bryce, uh -huh. uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, yeah. uh, it is. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the councillor is, is correct that uh, it would be that uh, deemed affordable under the uh, legislation. Also, there is also a phase in of new development charges. Uh, it starts at 80 percent, then is phased in over five years. So that's a, another. Uh, change in the development charges. Can I uh, can I just uh, respond to the councillors? Uh, I appreciate the yes. question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read something. It didn't come from Wayne Gates. All right. Okay. The Association of Municipalities of Ontario estimate that Bill 23 will reduce municipal revenue from developer fees by 5.1 billion over nine years. That's with a B. I'll repeat that again. Uh, it would the revenue will disappear of a. Uh, 5.1 billion over nine years. That is a substantial hit to municipalities right across the province of Ontario, including the three that I represent here. I represent Niagara Falls, Niagara in the Lake, and Fort Erie. $5.1 billion. That's how much they feel that municipalities are gonna lose uh, by, by Bill 23. And that's coming from AMO, which uh, you'll get the opportunity to go probably in August if they have it this time. No, but wait, I understand what you're saying. We are losing that $5.9 billion from the development charges. But if the provincial government reimburses that, re that to the municipality, it's still coming from the same, same taxpayer. That's the way I'm seeing. And I think we got the letter from City of Niagara the Lake. And I, they are saying their impact is going to be $1.3 million over five years. So that does not look like a big number from my perspective, and I'm not sure what the Niagara Falls number is, but what I'm saying is I'm willing to support any a legislation that allows for affordable housing for our citizens, because Niagara Falls, we have shortage of housing. People are living in our motel rooms, and you're aware of this. Thousands of people are living in motel rooms. <coughs> and the federal government is going to bring half a million people over every year, and most of them are going to settle in southern Ontario and odds are they'll become a Niagara region because we are cheaper than Brampton and Toronto. So I'm not talking about the whole province, I'm just worried about the Niagara Falls, that we, need, we are gonna need housing and we're gonna need them fast. So anything to uh, speed up the process, uh, that's what I'm looking for. I, cer I certainly appreciate your opinion, but I will, I will say that uh, very clearly at the start of my presentation, we believe that we should build 1.5 million homes in the province of Ontario. We support that. What we don't support is building the and tearing up the green belt. That's our issue. The other part we don't support is the financial hardship that's going to be on municipalities. And like I said, AMO represents 444 municipalities in the in the province of Ontario. They're saying and they've, they've taken a look at it, that you're gonna lose $5.1 billion. So we agree that we need to build housing, all type of housing, affordable housing, all kinds of housing, but we don't believe it should be done at the green belt and it shouldn't be done at the expense of municipalities. That's, I'm very clear on that presentation and it's why I believe that through the municipalities, whether it be Niagara Falls, Fort Erie or, or Niagara and the Lake or others, we should be putting as much pressure on the government so that it doesn't hurt the taxpayer, it doesn't hurt the municipality, and we build the 1.5 million homes without building on the, on the green belt and protecting our environment, protecting our air, protecting our water source, and protecting our flooding, which is a big issue in Niagara and the Lake, and we saw what happened in Fort Erie. We don't get as much flooding in Niagara Falls, but certainly uh, Niagara and the Lake in Fort Erie is a big, big concern when it comes to flooding. 
Councillor? I definitely agree with you because uh, green belt and uh, green land and wetland, they are not replaceable. I don't think we can bring them back once they are gone. I agree with you on that aspect. I was just speaking for the development charges. I Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other comments from council at this point? One, one other thing, the only other thing I would throw in here, it, it's a little fly in the ointment, I suppose. So now we don't really, we have very little green belt around us, Niagara Falls. There's a little bit on the uh, border of Niagara and the Lake. Part of our concern is the areas that were, I'll call it mismapped when they created the, the, the green belt. And certain areas that are not a green belt, but they've called it, they've labeled it a green belt. I'm sure Owen, you probably know more than I do because this is your area of specialty. But in Niagara Falls, uh, we've got Fruit Bell Parkway, which is a street with parking lots and buildings, and it's considered green belt. So in that area, when they try to redevelop and add on, they can't because it's classified as green belt, but it's not a green belt. And the other one that I'm aware of is the beacon along the QEW. Know the hotel there i think it's a best western that's classified as i understand as green belt it's clearly not and it hasn't been you know for for probably, i don't know how long 75 years um but that's a it's a hotel parking lot restaurants but they're they've been trying to add on but they've been denied because it's classified as a green belt so it's a misclassification so i definitely support the the you know correcting the errors i'll say of the mapping those things should be corrected you know, and definitely adding to the green belt, but I, I know what you're saying, and we're in, we're in a tough spot right now because we got a lot of new uh, asylum seekers uh, right here in Niagara Falls. They're all looking for places. We already had a crisis before they arrived, and, and I'm like, I don't, I don't have the answers. I really don't, you know, but, but hey, I 100% I agree. The environment's absolutely peril. It's important. It's, it's in peril, and, and I appreciate the passion. And uh, Owen, you're well spoken and passionate. Yes. You know, and, and you're much better yes. looking than, than MPP Gates. He's too. got a better mustache. <laughs> oh, he's got a way better mustache. <laughs> mustache nobody, is okay. No, nobody can touch it. It might even be better than Wayne's, but I'm not sure the other one. <laughs> Anyways, I just want to say I really appreciate the opportunity to come and show. I know Owen does as Likewise, well, and we certainly do appreciate the. Uh, uh, how we received today and the questions, and that uh, we're going to continue to uh, try to convince the uh, Ford government that uh, take another look at Bill 23, repeal it, and have the consultations, some of the things that you already raised, uh, let's have those consultations and talk to the uh, AMO and find out uh, what's in the best interest of the municipalities, because this is a real crisis, I think, for municipalities around affordability. Appreciate All you, right. taking, appreciate you. taking the time, and I just have a special request here before you run away. This is unusual, but we'll grant it because uh, he's here. As we've got our regional councillors, two of our three regional councillors, Councillor Morocco and Councillor Crater. Councillor uh, Crater would like to just make a, a comment, if that's okay, if you don't mind giving it It's always point. great to see uh, Kim. I didn't realize that he had a special chair here. I, uh, uh, I, I've been, this is my fourth term. I've never had a chair here. It's a the, heated the, once, once, I got, once I got out of here, they never got me back. But uh, <laughs> it's nice to see Kim and Joyce, by the way. The two of you is taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here tonight. And thank you for that. Uh, uh, Jim, thanks very much. I hadn't planned on speaking, but I do want to say a couple of really short words. Um, the Green Belt. I will tell you, the Green Belt is special to me because I was there, and I remember like it was yesterday when the Premier, Dalton McGinty, brought all of us in, the Liberal MPPs, and sat with us and said, I'm going to propose something that is going to cause a lot of controversy, so be prepared for it. And he started outlining his concept of a green belt. And the biggest thing that I remember he said to us is, if we don't protect the land, then it's gonna get paved over. And it's the farmland. And even then I didn't understand what he was saying. But as I started to research it, I realized the point that he was making is that out in the municipalities where land is owned by individuals, many of them and it happened right in Niagara and Lake because I sure got backlash from the farmers who owned the lands. And what these people who owned the lands were looking at is it was their retirement package. They looked at the concept that there was going to come a point in time where they wanted to retire and they were going to put their land out there to get for sale with the concept that they could go to the municipal councils and get it rezoned and going from farmland to subdivisions. And if you go to Niagara and Lake, that was already happening. And his concept was, if I don't protect the land now, it, and you've heard it over and over, it's not going to come back. And he was quite right, because when we introduced that legislation, 
I will tell you, Mr. Mayor, it was one of the most difficult times of my career as an MPP. Everybody was mad at us. The media didn't, I didn't remember, the media wasn't, what a great idea about a green belt. The environmental groups, I don't remember one environmental group calling me up and saying, go for it, this is the right thing to do. The people that own the lands, the farmers would never speak to me again, said you took away my retirement. Mm -hmm. I was gonna get, put the land up and have it rezoned. It was a difficult time. But I will tell you, I believed in it, and I was pleased to hear a number of other councillors who, I know you all feel the same way, but I'm telling you, and the strangest thing about all this, and I'll stop with this, is that there was only one, one time that I ever saw that, that the Premier of Ontario was ever recognized for creating and protecting one of the major pieces of land in this province of Ontario, probably in Canada, was by an international uh, body of, over in Europe that said this was one of the biggest, best decisions that was made in Canada by uh, an elected official, which was the Premier. So you should be thankful that a lot of the land that you see, and particularly in the riding that I represent, which Wayne does too, is Niagara Lake, the farmland would have been gone. They would have gone to the local councils and tried to convince them to allow them to rezone it into subdivisions. And I, was, I, and I will tell you, the other thing that would have amazed me was when I was an MPP, the number of, there were subdivisions that were built in Niagara-on-the-Lake that were farmlands, and the people that moved into those would call me up and say, Kim, there's a farm next to me. I don't like the noise of the tractor. I don't like the fact that they're fertilizing. And I would say, but that's the nature of their business. Like you bought here, it's a subdivision, but you bought here, you knew what was gonna be there. I said, we don't care, you gotta figure out how to stop it. You gotta shut it down. And that was the other thing that happened. So I wanna just say thanks, Jim. I hadn't planned on speaking. It's just that every time I hear the green belt, because I lived in that world for all those years, it really was special to me. It was one of the best decisions that the government made at the time. So I thank you. No problem, once a year. Well, that's it, you get one chance a year. That was one it. chance a year. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so a motion to receive the presentation. Uh, Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having us. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Good luck in Niagara Lake. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Safe. So, Mr. Clerk, will you walk us through this next section, please, of what we're about to do? Yeah, I think uh, we'll move on to section 5.3 in the presentations. Uh, we do not have the resident 5.4. He was not able to make it tonight, so that will eliminate uh, that step. But uh, at this time, it's appropriate to go to 5.3. Okay. So I'd like to introduce Kaylee Payot, account manager of MPAC, and you will come to talk to us about some MPAC issues. MPAC information. Information. We'll go with, sounds better than well, an see, issue, you're right? right? You're right. <laughs> Poor choice of words. All Welcome. right, thank you very much. I'll just wait for the PowerPoint to come up here. All right, while we're going, um, I will just say good evening. My name is Kaylee Pyatt. I'm an account manager with Municipal and Stakeholder Relations at MPAC, uh, looking after Niagara Region. So I look forward to working with all of you throughout 2023 and beyond. So whether you're newly elected or a seasoned official, uh, please know that we're here to help. We have an entire municipal and stakeholder relations team that is ready to answer any questions that you may have. So can I get this into presenter mode or? There we go, awesome. All right, so at MPEC, we are Ontario's property experts. Our job is to assess and classify more than 5.5 million properties across the province, which have a combined value of over $3 trillion. In the past year, Ontario has grown by approximately 45,000 new residential homes, and in 2022, we added more than $37 billion to Ontario's assessment rolls. Every municipality uses our assessments to make informed decisions about their communities, including the distribution of property tax. So we have four key players in Ontario's property assessment and taxation system, and they all have a different role to play. So we have the provincial government, which is specifically the Minister of Finance, who is responsible for setting assessment legislation and policies. Uh, they also determine the education tax rate. There is the assessment review board, which is uh, body and independent that will look over uh, appeals of MPAC's assessments, and they also fall under jurisdiction of the province. 
MPAC is an independent, not-for-profit corporation which is funded by all of Ontario's municipalities. Again, our role is to accurately assess and classify all properties in Ontario, and we do this in compliance with the Assessment Act and regulations which are set by the Ontario government. We are accountable to the province, municipalities, and taxpayers of Ontario through a board of directors that is comprised of provincial, municipal, and taxpayer representatives, all of whom are appointed by the Minister of Finance. Then we have municipalities. Uh, you're going to determine budgetary requirements, set tax rates, collect tax dollars to use for police, fire, roads, water, among many other items. And then finally, property owners who pay the property tax bill and help to set market value through ongoing purchases and sales of homes. So as you can imagine, maintaining Ontario's property database is very important. Property data is continuously updated so that municipal records are accurate when our municipal stakeholders are making important tax decisions. Maintaining Ontario's property database includes inspecting and assessing new construction, renovation and additions in a timely fashion, responding to property owner inquiries and assisting them to understand their assessments. We support municipalities by offering Municipal Connect, which is where our municipal stakeholders obtain the primary source of assessment-related data and products. And we work collaboratively on projects that are important to you, like digital permitting services. We have important statutory duties, such as responding to requests for reconsiderations and maintaining the people data for over 5.5 million properties for school supports. Monitoring the market and assessing newly built, renovated properties is just some of the work that we do on a daily basis to keep our property data current. We also periodically will update every single property in Ontario based on a legislated valuation date, and we'll call this an assessment update or the reassessment. The valuation date for the most recent assessment update, which took effect in 2017, has a valuation date of January 1, 2016. This is when we determined what every single property in Ontario could have reasonably sold for in its current state and condition as of a particular point in time. Now it is provincial legislation which will determine when MPAC conducts each province-wide assessment update and they are responsible to set the valuation date for that assessment cycle. The reassessment which was scheduled to take place in 2020 was postponed by the province to provide stability and certainty to all Ontarians and to enable municipalities to focus on responding to the challenges which were posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, property assessments continue to be based on the legislated valuation date of January 1st, 2016. Although the assessment update remains paused, our work continues to keep property data up to date. Property owners will still receive property assessment notices from MPAC whenever there is a change made to their property. In November of this past year, we mailed out approximately 800,000 property notices across the province to reflect these changes. Now, once the province announces when the next assessment update will take place and what the valuation date will be, we're going to work with you to let you know and have meaningful conversations as we work to finalize the new assessed values in your communities. So let's talk briefly about valuation in Ontario. There are three standard industry-wide approaches to value. We're looking at the cost approach, the income approach, and the direct comparison approach. For tonight, I'm going to focus on the direct comparison approach as it largely deals with residential, condo, and vacant land properties. Now, should you wish to have a discussion a more in-depth about assessment or the other approaches to value, I can attend a council training session, but I'm also available to you individually should you have any questions. So with the direct comparison approach, we analyze recent sales of comparable properties that were sold for a similar or identical use as the property in which we're looking to value. This will provide us with an indication of value. Now it is important to note that any sales used in the analysis need to be valid open market transactions. So when we're looking at the valuation of a residential home, although our analysis tools are going to consider over 200 factors, the five that you see before you will make up approximately 85% of the assessed value for a typical residential home. So we have location, lot dimension, exterior square footage, quality of construction, and age of the home. Now age of a property will be adjusted for any major renovations or additions that have taken place. Now what might draw our attention to a property, it's typically one of the following things. So we're looking at a recent market sale, request from a municipality or a property owner, building permit activity or the filing of a request for reconsideration or appeal. Now it is MPAC's role to take building permits and plans and turn them into assessment. Our municipal stakeholders rely on MPAC assessments to levy property tax. The sooner MPAC can deliver assessment, the sooner our municipal stakeholders can realize new revenue. Every year, MPAC processes on average around 300,000 building permits for renovations and new construction. 
Now, sometimes a property owner is not going to agree with their assessed value. A property owner might connect with you to let you know that they disagree with MPAC's assessed value of their home. But it is important to remember that assessments are not taxation. So a property owner should ask themselves, could I have sold my property on January 1st, 2016 for its current assessed value? They should log into aboutmyproperty.ca and ensure that the information that MPAC has on file for their property is accurate. While on About My Property, owners can conduct comparable research on assessment values in their areas. If a property owner still disagrees with their assessment, they have the option to file a request for reconsideration, often referred to as an RFR, and MPAC will review their property free of charge. There's also the option to file an appeal with the Assessment Review Board. Now let's take a moment to address the relationship between property taxes and assessment. Assessments distribute taxes, they do not determine the taxes to be paid. When a province-wide assessment update occurs, the most important factor is not how much the assessed value of any property has changed, but rather how the assessed value has changed relative to the average change in that class within the community. In anticipation of the next province-wide assessment update, we have implemented a strategy to address misconceptions between the relationship of assessed value and taxation. This includes resources for municipalities that will ensure when an announcement is made that we are here with the support that you need. There is a digital toolkit that is available on MPAC.ca, which is going to help municipalities, including elected officials, mitigate misinformation and provide support and resources to educate and inform property owners. In the digital toolkit, you're going to find a video on how your property taxes are calculated based on the assessed value of your home. I've embedded a link to this on the next page. However, we're not going to have time this evening to watch it. It's about three minutes, and I strongly encourage you to take a look um, as it does a really good job kind of breaking down that relationship. So with that, I want to thank you very much for having me out this evening, and we do definitely want to stay connected. So if not already, please make sure that you subscribe to our In Touch, which is our monthly municipal e-newsletter. This can be done through mpac.ca, or you can send me an email, and I'm happy to sign you up as well. So please be sure to reach out to us anytime if you have specific questions or are looking for further resources. Well done. Oh, sorry. Mike. Well done. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, do we have any questions of council for our presenter from Impact today? No, it was pretty clear, pretty concise. I don't think, uh, I think we understand. Perfect. And uh, it's always when your reassessments get done, that's when we start to feel the heat. We're here. Well, We're here to help, so that's please reach good. out. I appreciate that direct line because uh, that's always what happens, right? People come and they're all upset, and of course, you know, we tell them it's not us, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just Let's kidding. work together on this one, yeah, right? No, no. We're a team. We're a team. So uh, if there's no questions from council, then uh, we'll take a motion to receive the, re the presentation. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Neustag. We'll call the vote, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. And thank you very much. Thank Kelly. you very Appreciate much. Have a coming. wonderful evening. Okay, you too. All right, Mr. Clerk, what are we up to now? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. I appreciate the flexibility here. And I think uh, since 5.4 is going to be skipped over, 5.5 is a staff presentation. Uh, which uh, I know Tiffany is prepared for, but I think it'd be appropriate to have her hold off so that we can go to the advertised uh, planning, public, planning public meeting, which was advertised to start at 5.30. Okay. Um, just, just so that those people in the gallery are aware, uh, we do have, uh, we haven't forgotten about appointments to various uh, committees uh, that are gonna take place this evening. That's right, we'll keep you entertained. Uh, council will be, after the planning public meeting, uh, given an opportunity to go through those uh, ballots and make their decisions. Uh, however, it will be a little later in the evening before those uh, ballots are tallied and announced uh, in this room. So uh, feel free to stick around, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. So I think it's appropriate. Uh, there's your script, and we can go ahead and start the planning public meeting. So, Mr. Clerk, can we just to give our guests that are waiting for appointments an idea of approximate time frame on uh, when they, if they want to grab a coffee or go to the bathroom, or when, when do you think? Uh, well, if you had asked me that an hour ago, I would have been wrong, so I'd hate to, to make a guess. Um, it's, it's likely going to be at least another hour, I would think. Another hour, so 5.30, 6.30. So this way, it just gives you a little bit of time if you want to walk around, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do. Or if I was you, I'd be sticking around, catch the excitement of a council meeting. There's nothing quite like it. <laughs> All right. 
So Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? So the city's sign by law, uh, our public meeting is now being convened to consider amendments to the city's sign by law. Uh, the city's sign by allows for variances or amendments to the bylaw. Uh, an applicant may appeal the refusal of a variance by the planning director to council. If approved, the variance will be treated as an amendment to the bylaw. Therefore, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a site specific amendment to the city's sign bylaw to permit a 100% electronic billboard sign on an existing property containing a parking lot, uh, containing a parking lot at 5034 Victoria Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on January 31st, 2023, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Council's decision on this will be final and binding. Okay, now I'll ask Andrew Bryce, our Director of Planning, to explain the purpose and the reason for the amendment to the sign bylaw. Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, we have our planner, Peggy Boyle, ready to make a presentation. Okay, that's great. Peggy Boyle, uh, please come to the microphone. Good afternoon or good evening, not sure which it is. Um, I'm here to give you a brief overview of the sign bylaw amendment application for 5034 Victoria Avenue. The application is to permit a 100% electronic message center billboard. So the location map here, the subject property is outlined in yellow, as you'll see there. Um, there are two designated properties, heritage properties, located on the uh, west side of Victoria Avenue, um, shown in red, and they're approximately 38 to 45 meters from the proposed sign. Uh, the residential uses are located to the north, directly across Armory Street to the east and to the southeast. Um, and the 90 meter buffer, which is the blue uh, circle shown, is the minimum distance required in the sign bylaw between residential uses and billboard signs. Uh, the site plan here <clears throat> shows that the sign is proposed to be located in the northwest corner of the property uh, closest to Victoria Avenue um, and presently is uh, it's been noted that the sign is used as a commercial parking lot. This uh, slide really shows the two uh, perspectives of the proposed sign, one looking, the first one looking south down Victoria Avenue and then the one looking directly from the street into the property. And the bottom slide shows really the um, shape and size of the sign that's proposed. Um, basically, it's a Overall height is 7.5 meters, which complies with the sign bylaw, and it's 18 square meters in the sign area, which also complies with the sign bylaw. This slide shows the light study that was prepared by the applicant and shows the various light levels um, shown the property directly across on Armory Street is shown as having 1.86 lux as the light level shown, and the, the uh, which is below the sign bylaw's requirement of three lux. Um, and all other properties appear to receive less than 1.8 lux in light. So a 100% electronic message center billboard would not typically be, be permitted on a property designated as minor commercial, but the amendment process allows council to consider a 100% electronic message center billboard signs. Um, and Currently, the sign bylaw states the billboard signs are permitted on property that is designated in the official plan as major commercial, industrial, or good general agriculture. This proposed site is designated minor commercial, as I've said, but it is in a commercial area where other billboard signs have existed for a number of years and would not contribute to an undue concentration of signage. The sign is to be located within the 90 meter separation distance for residential uses. Uh, but the applicant has provided a light study that demonstrates that the sign will produce 1.86 lux, which is below the level in the sign bylaw. Uh, the sign is being recommended on the condition that along with the dimming technology, that the sign be extinguished during the nighttime hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. to mitigate impacts on the residential uses nearby. Along with similar applications along Thorold Stone Road, the use of dimming technology and the nighttime shutdown will minimize the impact on the residential uses, um, and as well as the traffic impacts on the nearby intersections of Jepson and Simcoe streets. Uh, the impact on the heritage properties across the street is minimized, 
um, as the sign is located across a busy collector road as opposed to being abutting or adjacent to these heritage properties. Um, and the required 300 meter distance separation from the nearest billboard sign uh, as required in the bylaw has not been achieved but is mitigated by the fact that the signs are not in direct sight line of each other and separated by commercial buildings in between. So the recommendation is that council approve the application to permit a 100% electronic billboard sign at 5034 Victoria Avenue conditional upon the following that the sign be equipped with photo cell technology to automatically adjust the sign's brightness based on ambient light levels and that the sign be extinguished nightly between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. so as to not cause any impacts on surrounding residential uses nor cause distraction to drivers along Victoria Avenue. Thank you for that, uh, Peggy. Uh, do we have any questions of council for Ms. Boyle before I close the public meeting? Any questions? Uh, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for the presentation, Ms. Boyle. I did have a, um, a clarification. There was notice. What was the notice? Um, how many meters or feet for the residents and businesses around? So the public notice that goes out for a signed bylaw amendment is 120 meters. Okay. So that would include the 90 meter buffer of the lights. Correct. Okay, so that's okay. Um, those are all the questions. I'll have comments later. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. There's no further questions. The public meeting with respect to the proposed sign, law, sign bylaw amendment is now concluded. What's the will of council? Councillor Thompson? It's not. Oh, yes. hold on, hold on, Councillor Thompson. It's not concluded, but then no. I guess. So the public oh, meeting. Oh, hold on one second. We're not ready yet. Yes. We do need to see if there's any speakers uh, from the public. Oh, I'm that sorry. Want to I talk. didn't know. Um, Another so rookie mistake. Online, <laughs> online, we do have Wendy Sturgeon available on Zoom, and she has made a request to speak to this matter. Okay. My apologies. I un <laughs> end the public meeting. So, uh, Ms. Sturgeon, are you available? I am. Okay, welcome to the meeting. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, councillors, and fellow residents. As a local resident of nearly 20 years living in the Jepson Armory Victoria neighborhood, this projected installation of digital billboard at the Armory in Victoria intersection is very concerning. And this is for the following reasons. There's an assumption, because it wasn't clarified in what we were given here, that this is for advertising. However, we don't know who owns the billboard. We don't know what they'll be advertising. We don't know if it's a two-sided sign. Also, we have, uh, sorry, I just flipped the page over. <coughs> We have not only drivers who could be distracted in this area, but we have many vulnerable people living in and around this neighborhood who use scooters and walkers. And we also have a bridge housing complex with vulnerable people. There's safety issues involved in this neighborhood. And as a resident living here, I would like to know what are they planning to advertise? There's also a school up the road I, there's just too many questions that I have, or uh, myself and my partner here. And um, as far as uh, Ms. Beal, thank you for that uh, report. The other billboard sign that was spoken of, it's not electronic. So that would be the only one in that neighborhood. So I guess I have those questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, did, um, Okay, so I guess at this point we get some answers. Uh, is this when we'd invite Mr. Raimondo to answer these questions, Mr. Clerk? Uh, yeah, if, if staff have answers to that, uh, they could certainly do so. And then failing that, we could have uh, uh, Mr. Raimondo, who I see is present, he could speak mm -hmm. on behalf of the applicant. Okay, Ms. Boyle, did, I don't know how you want to do this. You guys can decide. Well, I think have an Mulio, arm wrestle. Emilio probably has some answers to some of those questions. We'll okay, great. Yeah, great. welcome. If you could just introduce yourself. Uh, Emilio Ramondo, Ramondo Associate Architects in Niagara Falls. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, city staff. Uh, uh, I'm here representing Mr. Sinecropi, who's the owner of that uh, parking lot. Sinecropi, so that Sincropi, answers one question. Correct. Okay. 
And um, as you recall, he redeveloped uh, the former, uh, I believe it was an Enbridge or Hydro site yeah, hydro. Uh, as a parking lot. And the parking lot is there to certainly provide additional parking to the community, uh, but also service his tenants. So he owns the block to the south of the parking lot of a number of tenancies that were short on parking. So again, he's trying to accommodate his tenants. Uh, in response to the um, individual's question, uh, the sign is a uh, two-sided sign. Um, uh, as far as advertising is concerned, certainly uh, it'll be certainly has his discretion in terms of what he uh, intends to advertise. Likely no different than some of the uh, current signs that exist along Thorldstone Road right. and some of their uh, uh, marketing uh, requirements. Uh, uh, so uh, the sign is relatively high. It meets the bylaw requirements. Uh, certainly a good point uh, addressed by uh, Peggy was the fact that uh, the city establishes a, uh, a lumens level, uh, a lighting lux level. And uh, we spay, uh, played uh, extra attention to that. Uh, we hired a, a, a consultant, an electrical engineer, who did uh, photometric calculations and provided uh, a photometric plan. And we're about half the requirement uh, in terms of the established light level. So the signage is relatively dimmer than what you would see uh, along, say, Thorldstone Road. Mm -hmm. For the reasons uh, pointed out, we're concerned about the residences and uh, the proximity. But bear in mind, certainly um, Victoria Avenue is a well-trafficked roadway. So you have uh, a multitude of cars that travel uh, throughout the day, sp specifically more in the tourist areas. Uh, there's probably a greater intensity of traffic in that area. The purpose of any sign is to capitalize on marketing, right? So one of the concerns our client had was uh, the limitation of the hours from 11 to 7 a.m. And if there would be some consideration from this council to extend that from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., he would shut the sign down. But again, this sort of, uh, we were a little taken aback from the report when it mentioned 11 to 7 and how that, uh, how those hours were derived, right? So if I were to offer a comment uh, <coughs> through Ms. Mr. Sintacropi is uh, uh, why 11 uh, p.m. to 7 a.m. and why not 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, again, taking advantage of uh, the fact that Victoria Avenue is a well-trafficked route. It's one of the main arteries in the tourist commercial sector and part of his uh, ability and his pro forma to uh, pay for this sign is to provide advertisement and we felt that when he uh, proposes advertisement that may be a constraint on what he or may be able to advertise uh, in making that uh, that pitch so any other questions I'd be happy to okay. ask well them. just before okay. so first are there any questions that mr. Raimondo then we'll find out where the hours of 11 till uh, 7 came from we'll ask um, Ms. Boyle to come up are there any questions of mr. Raimondo while he's here Okay, so we found out it's two-sided. We found out who the owner is. Yeah. So um, uh, maybe we can ask Ms. Boyle to come up if you could help us uh, know where the hours came from. Certainly. I think that um, it was really derived by um, trying to imagine if, if this was a light shining into your home. Um, yeah. You know, you're looking at having it shine while you're trying to go to sleep. I mean, I don't know. 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. doesn't seem to me to be a... Um, a, a reasonable amount of time because if you're trying to sleep that's five hours and that's you know if there if there would be an impact on the residential across uh, armory street um and i do believe that somebody had suggested to me as well that the baseball diamond lights in the city are on from mm. are shut off at mm. 11 p.m so um, and they're okay. close to residential uses as okay, well, thank so. you for that questions of council councillor peter angelo yeah thanks your worship perhaps through you to mrs boyle um I believe that we relocated a sign, I think it was uh, where the roundabout now is. Right. Um, and we put it out on Thorstone. Was there a time limit on that one as well? I did look that up today, and actually that sign was from 12 a.m. to 7, 12, like 12 midnight to 7 a.m. I see. So I believe that was the time limit there, that, and that sign is significantly farther away from that residential use on Thorstone. Yeah. So, so we have established some type of 
shutting off period? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Your Worship. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, Councillor Patel. I actually have a question regarding to what the guest speaker said. Uh, that there are lots of people there with the one or other, with a the disability there in the area. Mm -hmm. And would the sign trigger their epilepsy? Because lots of people have problems with the electronic signs, bright signs. Right. So that's the one of the concerns I would have. I'm not aware of just exactly what triggers that response in people. Um, I think we have a minimum. I think our electronic sign talks about a minimum dwell time of a changing. I have to go back and check the bylaw, but I believe there was a, a time which they couldn't change the message any closer mm -hmm. than six no, seconds no, or no. something. So there is a standard that for the changing message on the sign, um, there has to, it has to have a certain amount of time. So I think that's to try and address that issue, but I've, I will verify that in the bylaw. And through Mr. Mayor, to Peggy. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to reduce the time instead of 11 o'clock? Can we turn it off at 9 o'clock? Because people do go to sleep earlier than 11, and there are lots of people live in that area. Right. I don't know. Um, okay. It's I don't know exactly what how, how we go about you know addressing the a difference in the time. Um, I suppose it it can be implemented as a condition of approval. Okay. Yep. But we'll decide you. that right here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, and the, and I know Ms. Patel is referring to the strobe light impact of yeah. people that cause triggers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can anyone tell me how many electronic signs we have in Niagara Falls? I know we did the one on Thorold Stone Road recently, and the number of meters close to a house was like, I don't know, it was 100 meters or something like that. It was a long distance. Do we know how many electronic signs we have? We can ask Mr. Oh, Ms. Boyle or Mr. Bryce, who would know that uh, answer? I can I can tell you, but I don't have the figure with me right here, but I will get the information for you because I do have it. Okay, thank you. And I, I was thinking about the 11 p.m. to 7 or 12 to 7 or whatever. Where this sign is going, a residential unit is right across the street. So if I was the sign, Ms. Rosolo would be... <clears throat> the residential so I'm not even thinking about sleeping if you were sitting in your chair in your living room would you want to be looking out at this bright sign moving so I don't think it's just about sleeping but I think it's um, the lights going into residential it is a residential neighborhood around there and I do understand it's minor commercial um, is did, did the owner look into a regular sign instead of electronic I'm really having an issue putting an electronic sign there with the residential in that area and being so close um, even if we cut down the time did we look at a regular sign well, we could ask uh, mr. Raimondo if uh, there's ever any consideration for a static sign uh, no. his preference is to go electronic right so if you had uh, one example I think the thing to remember here is uh, looking at the light level emissicity, right? So for example, the sign on Thorldstone Road is, I drove down Thorldstone Road at night, it's relatively bright. It lights up a great area of that portion of roadway. So in this particular case, we've lowered the light emission level. If the city permits three lux, we're hovering around 1.6, almost half that level. So the amount of lighting emissions from this sign, although it's electronic, is I'd say around half. And that could be lowered even further than what's permitted, right? So you've got to, you've got to bear that in mind when you look at this sort of concept, right? So the client, uh, these signs are very expensive. So he's making an effort to put a very expensive sign in. Bear in mind, if we were to put a double back-to-back -back billboard right. sign, you'd likely have the LED lights that light the sign up lit all night, unless you were, again, wanting to have those turned off. Right, so anyway, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, sorry, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I'm just thinking, even with the light turned down, it's still, I don't know how many, uh, five, 10, uh, 25 feet away to the next residential, whether it's low or not. I'm really having a hard time putting a, a lit sign in that area with residential. I'll listen to other comments, but that's sort of where I am right now. Okay. Thank you for that. Councilor Newstay. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to Mr. Ramondo, what, or actually to, to you, um, what is the overall benefit to the um, residents of Niagara Falls to have this sign? Are, is there extra taxes imposed upon um, billboards, signs that 
and is how significant. Um, Let's see if we can get an answer for that from one of our staff. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, uh, signs get assessed by uh, MPAC, so the best person to uh, tell you what it was just left the room. <laughs> but uh, uh, but they uh, are assessed as part of a, as part of the property tax uh, assessment, so it would generate taxes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or com uh, councillor Campbell? Yes, your worship. Uh, I, I didn't realize that there was going to be a lot of controversy with respect to this item and. I'm going to declare a conflict of interest because I live on Armour Street and uh, I will provide a form for the uh, city clerk. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. That's noted. So if there's not any further, is there anyone else, <coughs> Mr. Clerk, online or any? Okay, I'll come to you. Oh, sorry, we got Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, and I, 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 I know the electric signs, digital signs are, are really coming um, to effect now because you yeah. can do a lot more. You can have 10 on each side per month. So making more money for the, that person that's advertising third party is, is a big part of it too. I like the idea of, of being able to dim it as much as we can. And I don't know, can you, can you, can you write it and dim it at certain hours? Can you do that as well? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Council Strange. The intent is to have the sign dimmed permanently. permanently. Okay. So we would, that sign would emit 1.6 lux permanently so there's no uh, manipulation and brighter it'll be at one level kind of a dim and, uh, and sorry do you, to, do you know this what Lux is the thorough stone would you have any idea? I think it's relatively higher when we had first been asked to prepare uh, a photometrics plan uh, I think Peggy provided that level or that as an example <coughs> our engineers modeled that and the intent was to work well below uh, the mm. limits that were uh, required by the city. Uh, understanding its location, right? And just as a correction, uh, the sign is greater than 25 feet away from residences. Just uh, uh, correcting Councillor Lococo. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Uh, yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To that point, um, it may be Mr. Marumondo, could you tell me where, because right across the street is a, a little apartment building. 20 meters, 20 meters, not 20 feet. 20 meters. So that's like 60 feet. Oops. Isn't it just across the street? Right. Yeah. The road allowance itself. The road allowance is 20 meters? 66 feet. Just the road allowance. It's 66 feet. Okay, so it's 66 feet. Sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Baldinelli. Uh, through you, Mayor. Oh, sorry. Through you, Mayor. Um, can you tell me where that intensity is measured from? Is it like, is it 1.6 lux from wherever I look at it? So it's similar to this TV, for example. Yeah, it's, it's the way the, the light study shows there. It's, it's yeah. basically from the, from the <clears throat> center of the sign projecting straight out. As far as you can look at Right, I believe, yes. So yeah, and then, six right. And, and if, if there was any complaints, is there ability to lower that adjustment but still make it legible? If we were to, if we were to bring up that one slide that was prepared by the engineer, yep. uh, they've used the number of arrays. So from those arrays, yeah. you can see the arrays, the emittance from that location. And I think on those emittance, you can see some of the close residences and you can see the light level that's projected to, say the residences along uh, Armory uh, that would be closest, uh, the residence on the back side of uh, the plaza. So uh, call the arrays that are in red are well below the limits established by the city. The 1.86 is the, is the brightest projection straight off the front of the sign, straight away. Yeah. That would be the brightest. As you get out to the sides, it gets less so and less. So if you read right? those last year, 0.7, 0.3. Yeah, I understand, I understand yeah. the angle yeah. for, yeah. for this TV. What I want to understand is where do we measure three lux? For example, is it like 1.2 meters away from the sign projected out, or how far does that, that intensity <clears throat> go? And if possible, I'm not saying that, it, yeah. you know, with the acceptance of something like this, if we had major complaints about light level, would you still be able to visually see the sign under, let's say, 1.2 versus 1.6? Likely you could, like uh, at a dimmer level. Yes, so because you're obviously you're, when you're traveling, you're not going to be looking at a sign, you know, a kilometer away. Correct. You know, what you're going to see is visually as you're approaching it, walking or driving. So is that, is the ability to actually lower the lux value if 
if not, I'm not saying there is any other complaints came where it was too bright. Yeah. It, it's relatively, the point I'm trying to make, it's relatively low now. Okay. And I suspect our client would certainly be willing to look at that. If we were to look at the three, the, the three lux level, it would be extremely bright. Yeah. And, and that's, that falls within your city standards, right? Uh, so again, we, we've tried to take a proactive <coughs> approach, understanding the neighborhood and being, uh, your worst case scenario is 1.8. If you look at the red arrays, you're well below that. Uh, right. Everybody else. Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Oh, yes, Councillor Strange. Come on. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I'm just looking at, at the, the map there and, and the lights coming. Should, shouldn't we have a policy ourselves uh, with signs that they shut off at a certain time, like say it's midnight to seven? Shouldn't it just be all across the board, or are we just doing individual? As this comes up, so every single, single will go dark at one time. Every, whatever, <laughs> every single digital sign that comes, we got to decide what times. If it's a, if it's a yeah. standard procedure, yeah. at least we can say, okay, yeah. you know, like who's who, who are they going to affect by having advertising at midnight? Like who's? Oh my God, there's a, like I'm going to go there right now because it's advertised at midnight. You know, I, mean, I don't know what would be the difference if you can just shut it off and if we can have a way that we can have a policy. Okay, it's set a, a, an exact time that it shuts off and comes back on in the morning. Flying saucer. Flying saucer. Well, that's that's so uh, that's it's a good point, and uh, I know it because now everybody's got signs on their businesses, right? Every business from McDonald's to whatever have got signs, you know. So I don't I don't know the answer to that. The other thing that we had discussed before, and I, not that this would be worked into it, but I'm hoping when we come forward with a staff policy, maybe we'll have a look as well that one of those ads could be for the community benefit when we're promoting community events, you know, so that. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's Canada Day Parade or whether it's uh, Santa Claus Parade or any of the events, the market, things, you know, that we can have one of those spots, you know. I, I'm, oh, Mr. Raimondo wanted to say something. Just, uh, just on that note, right, you, you know, signs are usually um, uh, located in, in, in areas where there's more traffic. There's a direct correlation if you look at the amount of signs in your tourist area along your, your main arteries. There's a direct correlation to traffic, right? So uh, <laughs> there's an advantage for the prospective uh, sign purchaser to locate in those areas. But if you look at, say, uh, Victoria Avenue, you have a number of stagnant billboard signs, right? And you know, there's certainly a benefit to them, no doubt, but they also contribute to a form of, call it, visual pollution, right? And the reason for that is that they're stagnant, so you can't, you, <laughs> that billboard will stay up at a month at a time. So then to appeal to prospective uh, advertiser marketing companies, right, uh, you'd have to put more of them up in that, in that sort of distance. And you've addressed that with the bylaw by creating a separation distance, right? With electronic signs, you have the opportunity to appeal to a broader spectrum of uh, potential uh, opportunities of advertisement, right? So you would then therefore maybe consider fewer stagnant signs, right? So you can lessen that, call it visual pollution. Uh, otherwise you'll end up having, you know, as you, a, a, a staccato of signs, and you can see that on Thronestone Road. But the other thing on Thronestone Road is after the electronic sign went up, you saw fewer billboard signs and a few of them being taken down, right? Because they're probably owned by the same company or managed by the same company so they can have fewer stagnant signs in place maybe with one electronic sign. So that, there could be an advantage to that as well. I just pointed that out. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Newestay. Actually, to, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, going uh, along with what you're saying, Mr. Raimondo, what's the likelihood if we approve this that we are going to then have many more um, applicants wanting that same type of sign? So now Victoria Avenue, the way it looks um, present with one, are we, um, putting ourselves in a position that we're going to be approving many more because there are lots of vacant um, lots up and down that road in a minor commercial area. Hmm. Maybe we can get a comment from staff. I think you're doing, you're preparing a study right now, a billboard study in the community. Is there something going on right now, Mr. Bryce? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, yeah, staff will be uh, looking at the sign bylaw and reviewing the, uh, the policies hmm. and regulations in it. Uh, with respect to your question, there is a overall limit to the number of billboards that can be erected in the city. 
Uh, right now, we've got 141. The limit is approximately 150 based on uh, the current population. Uh, so that would control the number of uh, new billboards that could be entertained. Is that good? Okay, Councillor Baldinelli. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the question I have is, is, are the signs stacked, like the, whatever you're advertising, will it be a picture or will it be a video? For health and safety reasons. When you have something that's moving, you know, you're not going you know, to keep your eyes on the road, you start watching something. So it would be static, no. uh, or do you even know the answer? Like, I, I, I couldn't answer that. Do we have, do we have any bylaws? Good question. Or, you know, I don't know, Mr. Bryce or Ms. Boyle, is there any? No, no, there's nothing that addresses that. Do you think that's something that we should address? Maybe in our no. st sign uh, study, that could be something uh, that could be included in that? Might that be part of what we talk about, Mr. Bryce? Uh, yes, through you, Your Worship, that's something that we can uh, examine during the, uh, the study. Yeah, good comment. Yeah. Any other questions? You want to beat this one a little farther? Or do you, want to, you think we're good? Okay. Well, yes, Mr. Clerk. Although we are past the uh, point of the uh, public meeting where we allow the public to speak, uh, I have noted that uh, Wendy Sturgeon does have her hand up if uh, Council wants to entertain another question. Okay, Ms. Sturgeon, did you have another question? Ms. Sturgeon, are you there? Sorry, oh. I didn't know if I was on or not. Oh, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you for all those answers, Mr. Vermundo and uh, council members for the questions and uh, and the support uh, in regards to to uh, the vulnerable individuals. So um, aside from the the at uh, the um, uh, sorry, the uh, Epilepsy, there's also migraines that are triggered often by changing lights. One of the biggest concerns I had is like, what is going to be advertised? So this fellow, this individual owns the parking lot, okay. going to have a digital sign there. Uh, what's he advertising? Is it just parking? You know, I mean, that's different than advertising for sale uh, other, other products or other things, right? So again, with, with the vulnerable population, with the school down the street, it's, it's concerning. I understand the idea of a static billboard is, is a little you know, dated and whatnot. Um, it's, real, it's still a residential area and uh, setting a precedent of, of letting the digital sign go in, I think is not, it's something I don't support. We don't support. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. And I'm assuming this will be third party advertising. Um, it's not just going to be for the parking, uh, Mr. Uh, Three years, Mr. Mayor. Again, it could be to advertise his parking lot. He's got, uh, I think, about six, seven tenants on that block and across the street as well. So he may be uh, offering them the opportunity to advertise for their businesses as well as third party. Uh, but I mean, there could be some you know, discretionary measures. Uh, that Mr. Sinecropi may consider, if that's of concern. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When Councillor Baldinelli talked about video, um, in the report under transportation comments, it says a conversion to a full screen with moving video clips may be a distraction to drivers along Victoria Avenue. That's the transportation comments. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Okay, am I safe to close the meeting up? Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So the um, public meeting with, with respect to the proposed signed bylaw amendment is now in, uh, concluded. The will of council, I know Councillor Thompson, you've been very patient, <laughs> not. Uh, so, but yeah, go right ahead and make your motion. Yeah, I was uh, right to uh, start this and, and everybody had a, um, and I have um, looked into the uh, electronic um, um, signs, and we have a lot of them here in the, the city. And this is a commercial area, and there is not a lot of, in effect, I think, uh, Jepson. Uh, was the the house of the the person 
talking to us and they were talking about advertising and and maybe driven by it, not affected by the, um, and if you look at the, the um, electronic signs now, um, they are not as um, um, light as the, the billboards with the big lights grown up all on every night and they're more uh, a problem than the, the electronic one and the electronic um, they don't move and we have them all over the city and um, and I'm particularly particularly about this uh, property. It used to be the hydro, and when the hydro tore it down and built the, their new um, in a pin oak, um, they tore it down and they had uh, um, environmental study and it was um, con contaminated with all hydro um, um, problems and there was a, a cleaners about three or four commercial up and he was going out with his um, chemicals every night and and Dumping. putting in his backyard and not doing anything with it. And when they looked at the, the property and they looked at the environment, it was all the, the chemicals from that had been coming for years. So, um, and the, the individual who bought the, the cleaner, um, he was blamed. He wasn't the, the one who was dumping it, and but he had it. And so you have to clean up the property. And he ended up, um, we spent a lot of money with the city, the hydro, and him to clean the property, dug it all out, and it was, uh, um, you couldn't it's, uh, put a house or a building up there because the um, contamination is still there. So, um, and um, Peggy Boyle uh, as the dealing with uh, billboards for years and she gave a great report and, and recommended. And I don't think a lot of the um, concerns are, you know, how can you say what is gonna be uh, advertised on the, you can't. So, I've been involved in this and I would uh, make a motion for approval and for um, the council to be um, told um, about uh, what would uh, uh, be appropriate, appropriate for the lighting. I would and uh, include a motion um, um, about uh, um, increasing it, but I will re refer that to the staff, but uh, uh, I think 
this is a, a great, uh, it's only a parking lot and uh, a sign. So I think that's all he could do with that property. So I'm very pleased to move, move the motion for approval and refer the lighting, um, which I would be in favor of, um, to um, do that. So, okay. I so we have a motion uh, okay. by Councilor Thompson, put, uh, moving the three recommendations that staff have put before us. Do we have a seconder to that? Okay. Yeah, Councilor Strange. Yeah, just a question. So is, is this gonna be at the 1.86 Lux and shut down 1 p.m. to 7 a.m. as well? Is that part of the, that motion? Well, I'm assuming, but he's also suggesting that, that refer, uh, to staff refer to staff on the lighting. But Councilor Thompson, are, are, Mr. Raimondo, are you comfortable with the 1.86? Yeah, we're, we're comfortable. So the photometric plan uh, through you, Mr. Mayor Council, yeah. uh, we're comfortable what the photometric plan portrays. Uh, it's so got an adequate okay. lighting level. Okay. The engineers, I think yeah. uh, one yeah. consideration again is that 11 p.m. Right. to yeah. 7 a.m., right? The other thing I want to make note is uh, Mr. Sinecropi is spending for two signs close to $200,000. And these are through Jones Neon. They're a higher quality LED sign. So the pixelation is very minimal. So that's his, uh, yeah. uh, that's what he wanted to do. So these are higher quality LED signs. Okay, thank you for that. So what would a timing of midnight to? So till, till seven or what do you say, or, or till? Well, right now it's 11 till. Seven, seven. Mr. Clerk would like to weigh in. We've got a motion on the floor. We should look for a seconder before we start amending the motion. Yeah, that, that, that's good. And then we can amend. Are you looking to see if Councillor Thompson's? So Councillor Thompson, just for clarity, because we don't have a seconder yet. Um, in the report, it says 11 till 7. If somebody has seconds, I, I, I'm very fine with that. OK, so then we can amend it after. OK, so we have a seconder by Councillor Strange. Thank you for that, Mr. Clerk, keeping us on track. Uh, so now if somebody has a desire to make those hours different than 11 till 7, this is the time to propose an amendment. Councillor Patel. I would like to propose it maybe 10 or 9 o'clock at the evening to 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so there's an amendment to, so pick a time and then we'll Nine. see if there's, a, okay, there's a, a, a amendment a proposal uh, by Councillor Patel to go to 9 until 7? Yes, 7. Yeah. 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 Well, well, we can ask if it's friendly, which I'm assuming it's not, but it seems... Uh, are you agreeable to changing it to, to 9? Absolutely. No, shutting it off at 9? No. Shutting it off at 9, that's what I'm saying, as long as you understand. Yeah. Or... So that's what she... Yes, that's what... What's that? Right. Do I got to get a seconder first. Oh. No, but I got to see... No, okay, so the they're asking for 11 till 7. That's what they want. You've made that motion. Councillor Patel said well, nine till seven, so I need a seconder if you're not agreeable to well, that. Well, I you know, we could refer the to the staff to deal with the, I don't think it's a problem. Okay. What's not a problem? The 11? Yeah. Okay, so is there a seconder to go nine till seven? Councillor Peter Angel? Yeah, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Sure. Is this proper process? I mean, typically what happens is they ask the mover of the motion whether or not mm -hmm. it's a friendly amendment. If it's not a friendly amendment, I do believe that you have to take the motion that's on the floor first. Right. Okay. Well, we haven't taken the motion that's on the floor. Well, we did take it. We just haven't voted on it. Right. Well, you haven't you, voted on it. Well, you, I mean, you can't vote on it. You have to. It's. It, you can't vote on it. If no, there's I, amendments. Yeah. No, I believe you. No, I believe you do vote on it. Okay, so does everybody understand the motion? It's from 11 until 7, and if that motion should fail, then there will might be another uh, uh, entertainment of another motion. Okay, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, and I'll vote in favor, and that motion passes. Beautiful. Okay.
So we're, we're, it's approved with the way that it is here yeah. in the report, the three recommendations. Good. So we're done. Okay, thank you for that, everybody. Thank you, Councillor Peter Angelo, helping us get through that. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you. I keep pushing my buttons like that. So Mr. Clerk, what are we doing now? We're all over the place tonight. I don't know where we are. Uh, at this point in time, I would suggest that uh, we hold off on the staff presentation and uh, Good idea. deal with uh, item 5.1, which is the appointments to the various uh, committees. Okay. So all of council has been given a, uh, a booklet of ballots uh, with a list of every committee that uh, is uh, looking for applications or applicants. Um, what I would suggest is that the, uh, council could take some time to fill this out, and upon completion, uh, we would uh, just have those referred or turned over to myself. Uh, I'll have staff uh, coordinate that, and we'll report back later in the agenda. Okay, I've got Councillor Strange, and then uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this year, we had quite a lot of, of, uh, of residents that want to be on a certain amount of committees. Um, and, it, and it's tough because in, in this day and age, you don't see a lot of people trying to volunteer anymore. So I love it that we have this amount, but it seems like I know in, in Park in the City for sure that we have so many events. We have a tree, we're proposing a tree giveaway. We have tree planting. We have tons of events and, and along with recreation as well. Um, we have a lot of uh, people that want to be on these committees. First of all, I would like to propose a kind of a secondary kind of option that we can reach out to the members that are not picked to volunteer at some of these events, uh, in, in, on, a, on especially recreation and park in the city. Because we go to these events, we don't have enough volunteers, and, and we're having more and more events every year. In particular, for the recreation and park in the city, I would like to extend it from 12 members to 14 members. Is that a motion? Is that that is a motion? Yes. Okay. So we have a motion by Councillor Strange that we add two members to both park in the city and, and recreation. recreation committee. Yes. And as well, we have a secondary volunteer uh, committee that, that we we're reach create. out to them. The people are are aren't picked. We can reach out emails at, at different events if they. And that's a good way of, of judging whether they truly want to be in the committee for the, or maybe the next term or whatever it may be. If, or somebody drops out, then we have somebody, oh, well, that, that person can step in. They're here volunteering every single time. We might not know them. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's tough finding volunteers nowadays. Okay, so we have a motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. Discussion to the motion. Councillor McCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if we could hear from staff what their opinion is moving it to 14. I don't know if there's any mm -hmm. um, issues or not. Sure. Uh, Ms. Moldenauer, do you want to weigh in on that? Thank you, through to the mayor. Um, due to the number of events that Park and the City has in Recreation Committee, we can increase to 14. I would not recommend going any higher because it, it can be a large group to manage, but I know in the past we have kind of had a range of 12 to 14. Not enough chairs? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does that answer uh, yes? Okay, any other questions or comments before I call the vote? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So now, Mr. Clerk, we're gonna take some time. We're gonna play the music from, from what, Jeopardy? Uh, what are we gonna play? And then we're gonna go through and we're gonna tick the boxes. Is that right? Is that what we're gonna do? No, oh, no. Oh, no. Councillor Patel, yes. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I think to Mr. Clerk and all the councillors, I would like to suggest that we don't have more, an individual more than, on more than two committees because some people are on three or four committees. This way, we're getting quality or quantity because it's too much to ask for a resident to sit on four committees and give all the time to city. And we have lots of people interested in these committees, so it's a fair process for all the applicants to get a chance to sit on committee. So I would like to move a motion that uh, an individual cannot sit on more than two committees. Okay, so now how would we do this? Mm -hmm. We won't know until after we vote. Right, if they because if they don't get exactly. on one, I don't yeah. know how we might have to deal with that after the fact. I don't, Mr. Clerk, do you have any suggestions on uh, the suggestion by Councilor Patel? Yeah, it, it sounds good in nature. Administratively, you're right. Uh, we won't know until after the vote, and I'm not sure how this council will pick and choose if someone has voted 
for three or four or five as to which two they will sit on. Um, that's, that's not an answer that I have. Maybe we can work on for maybe next term, make it because it's not fair for hundreds and seventeen people who apply, and we might help maybe twenty people get onto all the committees. So it's yeah. just not a fair process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For that's a good idea. Do you want to make a motion that staff come back with a report for the next? Yes, time? I would. Okay, <laughs> we got. I wait. I see former councillor Juggernaut <laughs> Paisley Janvery is working her way to the po oh, to the podium. She's running. Yes, councillor Newstead. Can I also suggest for the next time, if we can have some sort of an interview process, we're given these names with the ma uh, matrix of um, the skill level, but I think especially um, working with them just to understand who's really passionate, want to be on it, because if we're making decisions, um, we're picking some over others, and maybe we're not doing the right um, justice to people. So um, maybe we can have the chair of the committee and a former committee member just interview them. This is, um, I congratulate everyone that puts their name forth. I think it's wonderful. We should be super excited that they're here doing it, and yet we're telling people that they can't. So um, just want to make sure. And maybe somebody's putting their name down and really doesn't have the time to commit to it, thinks that they do, whereas somebody else does. So those are questions that we can really figure out when we have a one-to-one -one interview. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I ask Ms. Patel, if, are you uh, um, open to adding that to your motion that we have the chair and maybe the staff member interview the people for that committee give them a quick interview and go over what's expected and what's involved oh yeah I agree with that yes okay so we've got it seconded discussion Councilor Lacoco thank you Mr. Mayor I'd like to add one more thing if it's a friendly okay, amendment okay well Ms. Patel will let him hold on a sec Councilor Thompson Ms. Patel's got to see if she's friendly to this we had great sorry Paisley give me we, a second we had great progress from our last time to this time we have a diversity and in inclusion and anti-racism committee and we want um, diverse people on our committees as well okay. eight out of the ten committees okay. had demographic yeah. information such as age, gender, if they identified as a person of color or if it was a person with disability. If I'm looking at five <coughs> equally uh, experienced people, maybe those demographics might help me choose the people. Do we have too many women on a committee compared to men? Do we have people who are age 25 compared to over 60? So those demographics were in eight of the committees, but not on two. Um, I have reached out to staff and I did um, bring this up, but I think that that should be part of the process, that it's on all, because I, I created a spreadsheet and I copied and pasted the, all of the, um, the categories, and then when I got to those two committees, they didn't have it. So I'm looking at people, I don't know how old they are, I don't know if they're male or female. I don't know if they're person of color. And we want every committee to represent our city. And sometimes we can't do that with the proper uh, information. Maybe they can do videos and they say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm, you know, like maybe that'll help too. Um, so uh, first of all, do you consider yes. that friendly? Yeah, okay, you do. Yes, Councillor uh, Newstead. Another friendly amendment. Is there any way, because we've got, everyone's committed for four years, but things happen in people's lives over four years. And um, is there a pool of... Um, people are an opportunity every year that somebody can just put their name forth if there are well, openings. I well, don't know how it works. Mr. Clerk, how do we handle that right now? Uh, typically what is done throughout the term of vacancies occur is in, in a lot of instances we'll go back to this list to see who those runners up were and if they were still interested in sitting on the committee. Uh, when that hasn't existed or sometimes later in the term, uh, we look to the committee themselves to make a suggestion. Maybe they've had some volunteers come forward throughout the term uh, that have shown great interest in being on the committee. So we work with the committees to come up with some suggestions as well to fill those vacancies. Ultimately, it would be council's decision. I like those two suggestions. If we can perhaps add one more that we open it up again because we have new residents coming to Niagara Falls and they may um, they wouldn't know about it if they weren't connected to anybody. So we could add that as well. This report's going to go about 800 pages, you, you know, but... Uh, oh, it's wonderful, though. It's good. These it's volunteers, it should be. The fact that we've got interest is the best thing. I think that's a testament to, you know, that they want to be involved in the community, which is terrific. That's how we all started, right, as volunteers. Yeah. So you're, you're good with that, too? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, can we still... Can we add a limitation on how many committees they can apply? Well, I think for this one, it's it's too late. Oh, not this one. I'm oh, we're talking time. about the next term. So then well, term limits. So you part of me? Yes. Yeah, th so okay. that can all be packed into the new Perfect. next report okay. for sure. Yep. Okay, so we've got that. Did you want to speak to the, the motion, Councillor? Um, I just want to uh, uh, talk about the uh, limit of the age. 
um, uh, this little lady, uh, um, Paisley, has been uh, doing work for the city for a long time, and uh, she's on several committees, and uh, I would think uh, that if we didn't have her on those committees, um, with her experience and her involvement, that would be really, um, uh, I think, um, uh, we mentioned 60. I think that's really, uh, shouldn't be on the table at all. No, 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 no. Excuse me, Mr. Yeah, Mayor, no, to I that know. point, I, I wasn't talking about limiting it to 60. On the application, there were age groups that you could tick off, and it was 60 plus. So that's all I was talking about. I'm not saying limit it at 60. Yeah, agreed. So just before we call the vote, I know Mississauga do, do had... Do have a volunteer of the century award for <laughs> We, I know Mississauga had Hurricane Hazel, and we've got powerhouse Paisley. <laughs> so Paisley, uh, did you want to come to the mic to uh, address council or should we bring the mic to you, whatever not, you prefer? Not really, thank you. Um, I just was wanted to make the comment about how many committees you can be on. When I was on city council for 21 years, I was on many, many, many committees. And it's never too many if you've got the time and the interest. So I would be opposed That's to that right. recommendation being made as to no, the number of yeah. seats yeah. you can sit on. Yeah. That's all. Appreciate that. Thank you. We should name a trail after you. Oh, yeah, we already did. We already did. That's right. Great idea. <laughs> okay. So you've heard the motion with a bunch of friendly amendments. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. So now we're going to start voting. So, you know, give us 15 minutes. Do what you got to do. And uh, we're going to start ticking away. Yeah, I would just ask that we stream if uh, we could keep the cameras rolling in case we're uh, challenged with an ombudsman uh, complaint as to what happened uh, behind closed doors. This is not behind closed doors. Uh, so let's just keep the cameras on. Maybe some good Billy Joel music in the background. <laughs> we will start the fire. Yeah, you know, we didn't start the virus. <laughs>
Okay, Mr. Clerk, uh, I guess we've returned. Uh, you want to update us on what we've done and where we are? Uh, yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, we just spent the last uh, few minutes uh, having all of Council vote for the various committees. Uh, staff will be tallying that up. It will take a, a little bit of time. There's a great number of uh, representatives, uh, uh, residents, sorry, that applied. Uh, so we'll come back to that uh, under communications. Uh, so let's just finish off with the presentations. Uh, item 5.5 is the last presentation on water wastewater uh, given by our Director of uh, Finance. Okay, Ms. Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, today we're gonna talk about the 2023 water and wastewater budget. Um, here at the city, it's kind of a two-tiered delivery system. So the region of Niagara um, is one part and the city of Niagara Falls is the other. We're gonna look at a little breakdown of expenditures between the two entities. Um, I'm also gonna touch on some of the rebate programs that we have, uh, our proposed rates, of course, and then I'm gonna ask you to approve it <laughs> with the rates effective to be April 1st, 2023. Um, so the region, they're responsible for the water wastewater treatment, um, the facilities and the pumping stations. They're responsible for sewers that um, span municipal boundaries uh, for part of the water network in the city. And they're a co-contributor to um, capital projects um, for the combined sewer overflow or CSO program. Uh, the region's rate structure for wastewater is 100% fixed. Um, they decide on a charge based on the three year average of flows um, and they adjust that with a true up at the end of the year that applies to a future year's budget. And then the rate structure for uh, water, 75% variable, 25% fixed. So these costs are all passed along to the municipality, which you'll see in uh, some future slides. And then for the City of Niagara Falls responsibility, we are the management authority. Um, operations is administered by municipal work staff. Billing and collection, of course, is administered by finance staff. Um, we here take care of the maintenance repli and replacement of utilities uh, infrastructure as well as um, charge the residents for usage and of course provide customer service to the ratepayers. So this slide kind of de details just a quick breakdown between the region and the city. So 46% um, of our water budget is cost passed along from the region. We have no control over that. That is the cost that they give us. 54% um, is our costs, the, the part that we're responsible for. Um, sorry, just flipping back for a quick second. Um, this is actually decreased from the 2022 breakdown, which was almost more of a 50-50 split. Okay, so this one's just a little bit more detailed, um, just gives you a little bit more percentages on the variances. So um, the regional charges have gone up about 488,000 or 4% um, in each area. Um, sorry, just let me find my spot here. And then we've got our transfer to capital reserves that stayed the same. This debt placeholders, um, it does say 801,000, but there's a lot of offsetting uh, development charge revenue. So you'll see in this tiny print at the bottom, the notation, the actual net debt placeholder budget's about $33,000. So it's not quite as drastic as it looks because most of those projects were um, DC eligible. That is uh, specifically the water main loop for Rexinger. And then the Montrose Bigger Rexinger Road uh, Reconstruction. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> that road name. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, you'll see the city charges, they've gone up there by um, about 1.1 million. So the bottom water budget's increased by 1.6 million. If you take out the region of 488,000, what you're left with is about a $1.1 million increase. A large part of that is locates. So this council received a previous report on that. The locate budget for water has actually gone up from 300,000 in 2022 to $720,000 in 2023. That's a $420,000 increase. Uh, there's also a new budget line item for $160,000 for leak detection. And then we've increased the meters budget by about 66,000. So it's up around 400,000 now. And then there's a few new processes in the um, research and development area for a geo database review, a prioritization tool, and a TCA process review. And those are actually two uh, new initiatives that you'll see both in the water and sewer budget. We've just spread that cost around. 
And then in terms of our, just some key points on the, on the water, wastewater, um, so I've already covered this, the regional cost 75% volumetric, the 25% fixed. And then I just wanted to touch on our asset management. So we recently got an update on our asset management plan in 2022 that covered the core infrastructure. According to the plan, uh, we should be at about $8.86 million annual contribution. We are currently sitting around 6.1 million, uh, so we're short about 2.76 million that we will work to increase. At the moment, this is subsidized in the capital budget by OLG funds, which is not a problem. That's one of the directives of council to spend the OLG funding on capital. Um, of that 8.6 million, it's broken out, or sorry, yeah, 8.6 million, it's broken out that most of that is for state of good repair and about 0.26 million, uh, according to asset management plan, was supposed to be for growth and update renewal. And I just wanted to clarify with the OLG, I, I've heard a little bit um, <coughs> that there might be some confusion. OLG funds do not subsidize the water wastewater rates, and it, they never have. Um, so just to be clear about that, there is no OLG subsidy in the rate budget. When I say that OLG is subsidizing here, it's capital projects related to water wastewater, which is, of course, a council initiative to use OLG funds for capital and fully recommended by me. Just some more key highlights there. We are asking for one new staff member. That's a water meter repairer. That's in the budget as well. Um, and then I, I've already touched on the debt placeholders. So the net debt placeholder budget's about 33,000, which is pretty minor. Um, we've put this in place. This is for council approved debt this year, although we won't actually incur the debt for, for a few years until the project is complete. Some of our rebate programs, so um, the senior water account rebate. At present time, <coughs> the current program um, offers $102 per account credit if you're a Niagara Falls resident, um, property owner who's residing at a property, sorry, water customer and property owner. If you're 65 and over and you're receiving the federal guaranteed income supplement, um, we certainly have talked during the tax budget about uh, revamping that program. Um, so more to come on that in a future report. But current state, that is, that is the budget we have in place, um, which would allow for about 1,000 rebates in 2023. And you can see I've got there, we approved 920 rebates in 2022. So that budget should be sufficient to cover um, the asks. And then we've got the high water consumption adjustment. So that's a budget of $35,000. Um, in 2022, we used um, $24,000 of that budget. And this is a rebate if you have um, a major leak, we'll rebate 50% of your volumetric charge um, on excess consumption during a period of a leak. It's a one-time only rebate per account holder, per property address for residential customers only. Then we have our sod rebate program, um, $10 sod watering rebate. So any resident who experienced um, any sod damage as a result of city operations will give you a $10 rebate because um, we'd like you to water the sod so that it lives. Um, flipping over to the wastewater budget, um, this one hurts a little bit more. Um, you can see the large increase from the region. It's about $3 million increase there. Um, the region makes up 56% of the wastewater budget. And then the city costs about 44% of the budget. Um, sorry, just again, so the regions increased their share of our budget by 4% there. Previously it was 52%. And then moving along to the slightly more detailed version, you can see there the region, that's a 22% increase that's gone up by $3 million. Um, part of that has to do with, like I said, how they do the true up based on the three year average of flows. Given that some of the past three years were COVID, um, they're basing our fixed rate on those years and then if COVID has rebounded, um, people have used more flows, like I said, they apply that true up to a future year. So that's part of what you're seeing there in that increase. Uh, we have not increased the transfer to capital reserves this year. We felt like the region increase was enough. We weren't going to push it. Uh, the debt placeholders uh, there for 266000 Again, tiny note in tiny print at the bottom, the actual net debt placeholder budget is 53000 because there is development charge revenue included there. And then the city expenditures have gone up by about 612,000. Again, you're seeing an increase in the locates. They've gone up by, by 148,000, uh, up to 240,000 from 92,000. And you're seeing an increase in uh, sewer rehabilitation. We've added about $50,000 to that budget. Asset management for wastewater. Um, so the, the requirement for the asset management plan is about 7.13 million. We're sitting at 6.5 million. So just a small difference, 630,000. 
That 7.13 million can be broken out further. The asset management plan suggested that we do 2.5 million for state of good repair, so that's repairing the assets that already exist, and another 4.63 million is supposed to be for annual growth and update. Then just, um, I did touch on the debt, but again, the debt placeholder in this case is um, the Montrose Bigger Rec Center Road Reconstruction. And then there is also debt servicing costs offset by DC from a, an old debenture from uh, a pumping station. The program we have in the wastewater budget would be the Weeping Tile Removal Assistance Program, RAP, not the RAP, pro RAP program. <laughs> Um, we've got a budget of $350,000. If you, uh, that would approve up to 67 applications if you were approving the full $5,200 amount. Not all applications are the full amount. Um, not all applications received are approved. Uh, if we did need to go over that budget, we do have some special purpose reserves specifically set aside from this program that we could dip into. In 2021, we did a rate review with BMA Consulting. Um, they recommended, they said we were on the right track. They could recommend we keep with the 60-40 allocation. So right now, the water sewer budget, 60% variable, 40% is fixed charges. The fun stuff, here's the rates. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna go up overall annually on the fixed rate, we're going up by almost $50 there from $512 annually to $561. On the volumetric side, we're going up almost 20 cents from $2.63 uh, dollars per cubic meter to $2.8 dollars per cubic meter. Uh, you'll see my little note at the bottom, that's, that's a previous note, but the region has committed to increasing <coughs> water by 3.8% and wastewater by 6% for the next five years. So we are going to continue to see some, some modest increases uh, coming forward. Just looking at the number of accounts, I like to point this out because um, you're gonna see me focus mostly on the 5H three quarters meter and that's because they make up almost 97% of our system. We do have larger meter sizes that would mostly be located in commercial entities, but um, as you can see, the bulk of our system is the 5H three quarters meter. So that is the one I'll focus on in these scenarios. Um, I'm providing you three scenarios here. A low water user using 85 <coughs> cubic meters a year. Average user would be 175 cubic meters a year. And then you've got your high water user at 275 cubic meters a year. So I had a little chart here doing a little comparison. You can see um, down at the bottom here that the low user is going from $736 annually to $802 annually. That's an increase of about $66 a year or $5.50 a month. Um, your average user is going from $974 a year to $1,057 a year, increase of about $84 a year or $7 a month or two Starbucks coffees. If you're going to be the high user, you're going up uh, from $1,200 a year to $1,300, up $100 or $8 a month. Just comparing to our other local area municipalities, Niagara Falls continues to sit in the bottom half of the chart um, for all three scenarios. So you've got, again, you've got your low average and high users there, and you can see Niagara Falls highlighted in the purple. That is comparing Niagara Falls 2023 rates to the other municipalities 2022 rates, as not all of them have set their 2023 rates yet. And then this is just showing what your monthly fixed charge is, is changing. So. For the 5H three quarters meter, again, 97% of our system, it's going up $4 a month um, from the 42.69 to 46.81. Um, I'm not gonna read out all the rest of them, but they're there for your reference. Um, all the other meter sizes from more of our commercial entities, uh, the monthly variance is included there. And then just a little plug for our dashboard. Um, so we have this great dashboard our IT people set up. Um, we're growing our number of accounts. We now have 9,381 water accounts signed up on our dashboard. Uh, you can sign up for e-billing, you can pay your water bill online, you can estimate your, you can report your meter reading, uh, estimate your water bill, you can sign up for pre-authorized payments, many great features. Um, we encourage you to sign up just to kind of keep a handle on your accounts and sign up for e-billing. And lastly, recommendation. Council approved the 2023 water wastewater budgets and associated rates uh, to take effect on April 1st, 2023 as presented. Uh, staff have already um, prepared some inserts to go in the water bills that um, they can go out as soon as we learn if this is approved or not. So we'll get the messaging out as soon as possible.
Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Any questions first of uh, Ms. Clark? Uh, Councilor Lacoste. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. On page nine of the presentation, the high water consumption adjustment, it said that it was budgeted for 35,000 and it said um, to date 24,000, but when you were just speaking, you said it was 24,000 for 2022. So that's not for 2023. Okay, that's good. And then the last one, um, for the annual residential charge comparison chart, there's only 10 municipalities there. Why, why do we not include the other two? Um, Wayne Fleet doesn't have uh, water. Okay. Am I missing another one? There was only 10 there. No, they're there. Oh, yeah, Grimsby special. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> through, through the mayor. Grimsby does uh, their sewer rates on their tax bill, so they only have water only on their water bill. Okay. So it'd be kind of a misnomer to include them. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? It's like three strikes tonight, I think, right? Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just had a question through you, uh, perhaps not to Ms. Clark, but maybe to Mr. Nickel. Uh, it was just in regards to a newspaper article that I read, and it was about the region as, as they were going through uh, their budget process, and it was talking about the challenges that they had, and it was saying that uh, in their wastewater, in their water wastewater system, um, it was the, the figure was 70% of it was in poor condition, and it was something that one of the councillors had called a very sobering figure. Um, I just wanted to know whether or not uh, Mr. Nickel had any information on, basically, Your Worship, whether or not we were affected by that, um, simply because, I mean, it's a two-tiered system and we rely on the region. The region is the one that controls the plants, they control the major trunks that get the water to our city, and then from there we take it and we distribute it to all our homes. So. I don't know if staff have any information or whether or not it's even a cause for concern or maybe even a misprint. I don't, I, I, I don't know. But Mr. Nickel would be happy to answer that. He was just saying before the meeting, he thought he was hoping someone would ask him something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to answer the councillor's question, I think there's two parts to the question. Um, certainly, I am concerned. I, I was able to find that report pretty quickly because it's uh, published in January's Niagara Falls Review. Um, what concerns me is the report indicates that 70% of the regional water wastewater assets might be in poor condition. I'd like that to be um, that number to be a lot less. We'd all like that number to be a lot less so that our infrastructure is more reliable. Uh, we rely on their services um, to clean the water and transmit it to the pipes that we can send to our customers. So for one, I, I want to make sure that we have reliable infrastructure. Two, the cost to maintain that infrastructure is passed to our customers. So all of our customers are paying for those regional fixed charges. So their percentage of increases are passed along through to our customers. So I want to make sure that the infrastructure is affordable and it's reliable. Uh, and what I'd like to do um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor's question is to explore this further with the region, potentially come back with a report that has some sections of their asset management plans and what the region plans to do about this uh, poor level of infrastructure in the system. Yeah, I think that would be great. If you need a motion for that, if not, it's just I'll take direction. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. If there's no other questions, we're looking for a motion. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Oh, yeah. Okay, motion by Council Thompson that we approve the 2023 water wastewater budget and associated rate, second by Councillor Strange. If there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. And Mr. Clerk. Okay, we're on to reports. <coughs> Excuse me. So first off, we have 7.1 CLK 2023-02. Uh, there's a fee waiver application, 44th Annual Women's Place Book Riot. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo that we waive the cost. Second by Councillor Patel. Um, the recommendation that we adopt a new process, first of all, to approve fee waiver requests as outlined in the report. And secondly, that Council defer the approval of preferred preliminary fee waiver application until March 21st. Okay, so that's the, the motion. Any, if there's no discussion to that, we'll call the vote. What oh, did you have discussion? Yeah. Yes. Um, Go ahead, Councilor take. Just reading this, I'm wondering if we're thinking about this in a different, or we can think about it in a different way. 
So we should be happy that these people are spending their time. So it's more of a, a hand up than a handout. So a few weeks ago, we had those agencies come, and it's dollar for dollar that they're asking. In a case like this, they're the return on their their investment. If we're looking at that six thousand nine hundred fifty four, and they're making ninety five thousand, why would we not encourage more of this instead of limiting and capping uh, fee facilities? Well, we could get that question to staff for some feedback. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, <coughs> one of the issues is you're we're giving up other revenue uh, in in this case. So the rental of the uh, uh, of the one pad, especially as we're trying to generate more revenue to offset the cost of the taxpayer. Um, so when it, it, whenever we're waiving a fee, we're either incurring costs um, that has to be made up somewhere else. That's why council has been set a budget of $55,000, which last year council wasn't very successful at maintaining uh, the budget. Um, so um, if you're encouraging it and there is more fee waivers, it's, you're essentially just putting more tax on the taxpayer to um, to have that. So it, it is a discretion of council how they want to set their budget and how they want to spend their budget. But there is a revenue offset. In this case, uh, the arena is not rented for, I believe, a week uh, because it's set up and tear down. So we, we lose a week's worth of rental um, uh, at the at the four pad for one of the pads. And is it going all the, oh, is that uh, four floor pad being used the entire time? Like, is there any downtime so it's not even costing money? But that's not really my, my questionnaire. So what I'm trying to get at is that instead of um, these agencies coming in, I know there's concern on staff, dollar for dollar, so they come with that $250,000 ask, and it's it's pure taxpayer dollar. Where in this case, we're spending six, we're helping them with $6,000 to generate 95000 So we're letting them do the work. So yes, there is some cost to the city, but it's far less than just handing over money and I think it's not only is it the cost there what it does for our community it adds way better quality of life we um, we have an event that involves people um, people are involved they're engaged it um, I think waiving something like that's the benefit not only monetarily but non-monetary value really adds up and then we wouldn't have to give those complete $250,000 ask when people are doing it and it all goes for a good thing so maybe we can even look at something that says well let's look at the the return on investment, something like that, if you're going to use that as an actual cost, it turns out to be, what, 13.6% return on money, which is pretty good. So I think um, ha giving people a hand up as opposed to a handout makes sense. And it's not all total cost either because there's a revenue part to it and there's HSD that they get back. So it's not really <coughs> that pure $6,954 cost. Uh, no, that's just the estimated fee cost on that. But uh, the council raises good points. This is why... Um, you know how council makes their decisions on what how much to waive of a fee or whatever you're you're looking at a um, a return on investment a calculation i don't know how councillors vote uh, individually on how they want to waive fees those are all things that individual councillors can decide um, the procedural change is to stack these up a bit more so that you can make some of those determinations a little bit better because in the past um, we just uh, took these in on an as-come basis and then you made a decision and you didn't have the ability to say, well, is this one getting a better rate of return for my investment versus this other one? Um, so, you know, council can certainly, all we've asked is to defer this one till next uh, month and to group the approvals a few times, three times a year uh, so that council can make those decisions. You know, at the end of the day, what all we're trying to really do is try to help council stay within their budget of $55,000 for their fee waivers that they grant. Uh, last year, we were over budget by about $30,000 so, uh, on, on that. So, you know, these are all good. Council, unfortunately, will have tough decisions to make if they want to maintain their budget. They're all good uh, charities that come forward. They all have good uh, items that they want to put forward for council's consideration. Uh, staff was just uh, recommending that this one just be deferred by a month. Uh, so that if there's other applications, you can make that decision. Alternatively, what we've said is council can decide to make a partial um, waiver. Uh, you don't necessarily have to give all 6,000, then you can wait till the end of the year after you've seen more come through and whether you want to allocate of a refund back to some of the members so that you can factor in those decisions. Staff is not recommending any way for how, how council evaluates who should get a fee waiver, how much or what percentage. We just put them forward for council's approval, that's it. And, and that's a good point too that you make, Councillor, that 
not every minute of every hour is rented out at the arenas. So I know we just, you know, try to encapsulate a number, but that's a good point. Councillor Patel. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. CEO. How about we have a different rate for the nonprofit agency at the arenas? Yeah, thank you. We do have a nonprofit rate for rentals, uh, whether that's our boardrooms or our um, or our floor rates. Uh, okay. So uh, that's that's the fee waiver for the, the not for profit rate for okay. for that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Lecoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I like the idea of what, what Councillor Newistig was saying. Some of the applications are nonprofit, so that's really too easy to look at. Here's an event, here's how much we're making, here's how much we're asking. Some of them are not nonprofit, they might be BIAs, so there is no ROI, there is no here's the dollar amount. So maybe we could have different rates for a nonprofit compared to a non nonprofit, like a BIA or something like that, if, if we could look at that. Does non nonprofit make a profit? <laughs> <laughs> a for profit. Okay. Okay, good. So I don't remember, did we vote? Now it's been so long we've been talking about this, I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, the motion is by uh, Councillor Peter Angel and seconded by Councillor Patel, but I just want to make sure that Council understands that we're not actually, uh, the, the recommendation is not to actually approve the, uh, the current fee waiver, but to defer it uh, to the March meeting. Yeah, correct. We all understand that. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Next up, 7.2, Strategic Plan 2023-2027. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we adopt the two recommendations. Councillor Coco. Mr. Mayor, I had two comments. One, I was wondering if there could be in-person sessions instead of just the, um, the let, let's talk public engagement. Sometimes people aren't on computer and they'd like to have um, in-person segments. And the other thing I was thinking was, um, I know that staff put a lot of information and work into this and they came up with the three pillars. I don't really want to be tied down just to those three pillars. I think once we all get together, I'm sure everybody's going to have different ideas. We might land on those three pillars but I don't want to be tied down to them that maybe some of our discussions will go in a different way. Never tied down. It's uh, a living document and uh, evolving. Yeah, it's always okay. evolving. It's just a guiding principle kind of thing. Um, okay, so any other questions or comments? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Council. 7.3, fire apparatus acquisitions. There's two recommendations. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Patel, that we move the two recommendations. One is purchasing a pumper five, mm -hmm. and secondly, that we authorize single source procurement for purchase of a demonstrator multi use vehicle for a fire department. Yep. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Fire Chief Joe thanks us too. Mm -hmm. 7.4. Niagara, St. Catharines in Toronto, also known as the NSNT Trail Feasibility Master Plan. Councillor Peter Angelo. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell. And Councillor Peter Angelo would like to speak to the three recommendations. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, this is something that we've always wanted in the city. I mean, we have our north south mm -hmm. trail, which is the Millennium Trail, and then this will be our east west. Uh, my comment through to staff I'm excited to see that this is going forward. However, when I look at the timelines, and I understand that um, you know, part of it has to do with money. Uh, because it's going to be an accessible trail, it's just going to take that long to build. But the build out of this trail is well into the 10 year uh, plan again. So, I mean, you know, when you take a look at some neighboring municipalities, uh, they have different types of uh, trails whether it's stone dust or whether it's natural trails, they don't all have to start as asphalt trails. I think asphalt trails are just super expensive and they take so long to implement. Is there any way that we could go with a, a different surface option instead of asphalt to establish the trail? And then as we come along with our capital funds, we can go back in and we can asphalt certain portions of the trail. But establishing the trail really is the big part because that gets the trail there. It gets it being used by people. And I think what you might find as well is that some people prefer the option of non-asphalt over asphalt. So 
I mean, to me, it's two factors, really, that, that lead me that way. Well, um, maybe three, because I really like the non-asphalt trails myself. Um, and then the other two factors would just be the cost and then the time to implement. Because the time to implement, again, we're looking at more than 10 years to get this trail done. It's a great idea, but it's way out there in terms of time. So we'll get some feedback from Mr. Nickel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, staff will certainly take that um, option into consideration. You know, this exercise was about looking at the long-term and ultimate vision to make sure we don't lose sight of the corridor, make sure that we implement when it's appropriate to implement. Um, we will, like, like all of our projects, require to go back to our Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, for some comments on this. I think if we can outline what the plan might be, and there might be some segments that are more appropriate to connect with paved linkages now, but other segments that might be more appropriate to leave with stone dust or gravel for a little bit longer. So if you will let us um, take that uh, feedback back and work on a, a bit quicker implementation plan. The other thing I will add is this, um, you know, I know it took the Millennium Trail about 20 years to construct. We do want to get this one done quicker and we do want to take advantage of, uh, of upper tier funding opportunities when it comes. So we, uh, we you know, for all those reasons, we, we're going to try to look at that option and others to try to accelerate the project timelines. Thanks. Do you want to add a fourth recommendation uh, for that, just to make it that with the, the, the objective of expediting the, the implementation of the trail? Yeah, absolutely. And I like what Mr. Nichol said in terms of accessing uh, upper tier uh, yeah. level funding. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that just lends more to the fact that if you have the actual trail established and it's stone dust, you can go in at any time and pave certain sections. You can even wait until funding is there or it's available from upper levels of government until you actually do do the asphalt. The important thing to me really is to get the trail established and get it being used by, by our residents and then you can go in any time you want in Nashville to. Yeah, I agree, because not, not, some people prefer a non-paved trail. I, yeah, I know, I understand that. More natural-ish. Um, so, I'm sorry, just excuse me one second, Councillor. Uh, so, are you going to add a, a fourth? Yes. Okay. Is the seconder um, yes. good for that still, too? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a Zoom meeting with Mr. Nickel and um, Mr. Antonson. I, I had a bunch of questions. In 2018, when the report came out, it was $4.8 million. This report is $12.3 million in today's cost. That was back in 2011 cost in 2018. So it's gone from 4.8 to 12.3. Um, the survey that we put out to the public, Parks and Rec came in number six out of nine. $12.3 million is a lot of money to be spending at this time. I think the, the trail idea is great, and I talked with Mr. Nickel about um, putting it in the master plan that, you know, that those are our intentions. We can use Grant Watch to be looking for, for grants. Um, I agree to the concept, but I don't want to tie us down to approving $12.3 million over the 10 years. Um, we're in a very fi difficult financial position right now. Yes, we need the information to go under the master plan, but I don't want to commit the dollars at this point. Uh, yep, Mr. Sale. Just for clarity, I thought the motion was for a quicker implementation plan, but no financial commitment. That would have to come through the capital budget plan. So I believe Mr. Nickel was going to take it away to uh, come back with an expedited uh, potential plan, and that would have to feed through the capital plan, unless I'm unless I misunderstood the the fourth motion. Uh, but if 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 not, it, it was not to actually commit to the dollars. Was to ask staff to come back with a faster plan than ten years, which would then feed into the capital budget at that point in time. So by approving this, we're not committing to the twelve point three. We're just committing to yes, put it in the master plan, come back with it expedited with dollar figures and capital, and, and at that yeah. point. And that would be fed into our uh, ten-year capital plan at that okay, point in time. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Strange. Yes, you, Mr. And just want to add, like making it more of a natural trail will bring the cost down considerably, I would think. Would it not, Mr. Nickel? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, it's a little more to maintain annually, but capital costs are much lower. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, 7.5, Falls View Boulevard Reconstruction Phase 2. There are three recommendations. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Uh, discussion, Councillor LeCoco. I'm sorry I have all these questions tonight. Right. Uh, on page two, it says the enhanced streetscaping was envisioned by local business owners to bridge the gap. 
since the start of the project. Are local business owners putting in money? The, the, the phrase seemed to me that at the beginning it was envisioned, but is that what's happening now? Maybe we'll get our staff to weigh in on that. Mr. Nickel? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So this section of Falls View is the gap between the two BIA sections. Um, I don't, I wasn't prepared for the question, so Sorry. I don't have an answer. That's okay. This budget goes back um, a number of years to, um, you know, uh, I think it even goes back to 2018. And um, what I don't know is if we have any, uh, we call it Section 37 or streetscape improvement dollars from height bonusing in this budget. So I, I don't have uh, any firm numbers, but it's, the budget is not made up of, of significant contributions from developers or from adjacent <coughs> property owners. It's primarily uh, from development charges, and then it's uh, $5 million gross. About $4 million of that was from water and sewer um, uh, contributions uh, from the city. Okay, thank you. Through, through the mayor, I was wondering if Ms. Clark would have that answer. Would you happen to know? Sometimes you know. <laughs> Sorry. She just knows things. <laughs> through the mayor, I can, I can take a minute to try to look for it. Maybe we can move on and I'll let you know. Just because it was in the report, it, it sounded like that business owners were contributing to it, and that's all I wanted to confirm. Okay. Or through the BIA. I don't know, is the BIA... No, it's not a It's not. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Hmm. Okay. She like, should we move on? Is this like a two minute thing or 10 minute thing? Two minutes? Two minutes? Okay. Do you have that music again, AJ? Like, we okay? <laughs> we can wait for a minute just to check so we can before we move on. I agree. I just saw it because it, it's just it's a button you want to push. Right? Oh yes, uh, Miss Clark, that was quick. It was one minute. <laughs> Through the mayor, um, I don't see any any revenue contributions from any uh, residents or private businesses. It looks like mostly just uh, transfers from our our capital reserves operating in water. Okay, does that help, uh, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Maybe that report can have an addendum that there's no contributions. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, good catch. Any uh, other questions or comments of Council? Okay, so we call the vote, right? Yes, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, 7.6, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application, 3770 Montrose Road. There's a recommendation that Council pass a bylaw to remove the holding symbol and related regulations. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange. If there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 7.7, .7, draft plan of subdivision, exemption from common elements condominium on Mewburn Road. There are six recommendations. Yep, motion by Councillor Thompson. Yep. Okay. Motion by Councillor Thompson. Second by Councillor Patel. There's no discussions. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous too. 7.8 Municipal Housing Target and Municipal Housing Pledge. Councillor Peter Angelo? Uh, yeah, Your Worship. I'll move the motion. I also have some comments. Okay, we'll get a seconder. Councillor Strange. Okay, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, microphone, please, Council. Oh, I thought I hit it. Rookie mistake. Good. All right. Um, yeah, I guess my first comment, Your Worship, is I really like the third recommendation that staff put in there in regards to uh, getting the endorsement for the South Niagara sewage treatment plant. I think that's important when we talk about adding, you know, 8,000 or more residences or homes in our city. Um, our current infrastructure or the plant that we have in the north end 
you know, it, 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 it's, it's pretty obvious that, that we need more help than just that plant. Um, so it's nice to see that staff put that caveat in there to say that, yeah, we can achieve this goal as long as this plant comes along. And I know we've talked about the plant, like, you know, many times. So it's just nice to see that that's a caveat there. There's some other things, Your Worship, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, just uh, Councillor Strange and I had the opportunity to meet with a couple of staff members uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ms. Dolch and, and, and Mr. Nickel, just kind of brainstorming some ideas that have been, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, coming together for a number of years now at Park in the City. We've been talking <coughs> about, you know, how do we get more trees into the city? Um, ever since uh, the ash borer came along, it really took away a lot of the canopy that we had here in Niagara Falls. And, uh, you know, we did make some progress last year. We were able to have the urban forest strategy approved and Mr. Burgess was nice enough to show up to our uh, Park in the City committee meeting and, uh, you know, he gave the committee some reassurance that he would uh, beef up the budgets, which he did in our capital budget. Uh, he made a significant increase in terms of the amount of money that the city is going to put into new plantings and then in our operating budget he also added a crew uh, for maintenance of our trees and while those are good starts your worship i really think that we can do more um, just to give you an idea like the park in the city <coughs> committee we have typically two tree plantings a year we're always looking for uh, new trails um, underutilized parks other municipal lands that we can plant trees on but it's difficult because when you plant a tree you want to be able to make sure that that tree can stay there for 50 plus years you know we're always hoping to get a hundred years out of it we don't want to have to put a tree in and then move it it's 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 kind of a waste of our dollars um, so <coughs> that's part of our challenge um, <coughs> the opportunities that the, that we have municipally to put trees in, like I said, we have trails, we have parks, we have limited other lands that we own, especially in the urban area. I know Mr. Burgess is looking into uh, hydro corridors, putting trees on hydro corridors. Other than that, we have our street trees. That's on the that's on the publicly owned side of 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 it, and I, I guess our conversation is centered around bringing in the private side, which would be individual <laughs> homeowners. And <clears throat> I'm getting to why I'm bringing this up now. I know, I, yeah, I know. Take your time. Okay. You got all night. Yeah, thanks. So on the, on the private side of it, Your Worship, there's really, there's really two different categories, as you can see it. There's the homes that are already built, and then there's the homes that are unbuilt. Here's where it's gonna relate. It's gonna relate to the unbuilt homes. So just on the issue of the built homes, it's pretty hard for us um, to actually go into a place that's already established and put more trees in, with the exception of street trees. And I mean, that's a, a different conversation for council at a different time. I believe that we should get a lot tougher in the sense that we should enforce that a tree goes in front of every home. But that's something that I disagree with um, on perhaps with the engineers because um, trees in front of homes, they cause uh, they cause problems, and, and Mr. Nichols kind of smiling at me right now. Whether it be in terms of uh, water laterals or sewer laterals, or something funny. they lift up people's driveways, they lift up people's sidewalks. So I understand that, Your Worship. Um, so um, one of the things that we uh, decided to do with Park in the City, and the program's going to get rolled out this year, is we're going to give away a thousand mature trees. Uh, they're going to be trees that have already been in the ground for 10 years, so they're going to be of a very good size. Um, we already have a sponsor for it, so we're going to try to do that every single year. That'll be a thousand trees that are going to be going on to private lands, not public lands. It's very different than planting trees on our trails and our parks because they're going to go on private lands. We're not actually going to take care of them. And that's in the built side. And then we get into the unbuilt side, and that's where this report comes in. This report is looking at bringing into the city, you know, 8,000 units. And part of what we have the ability to control is the policy when we approve these units. Right now, for a single family home, we require one tree from a developer that goes in front of a single family home. What if we required, to, uh, sorry, what if we required two? What if we required one on the street and one on the actual property? We're now doubling the amount of trees that we're putting into built subdivisions. 
I mean, the policy or the, the report that we have in front of us is somewhat generated from the provincial government because it aligns with their growth plan. So we have to adopt their growth plan, but I think it's up to us to decide how we want that built form to look. We can add more green into our own city if we only take a look at the policies that we have. And, and, and that's where I want to pass it back to staff to come up with some ideas. I know Councillor Strange and I have thought that, you know, for every home that gets built, perhaps instead of putting just one tree on the street, we can have one tree on the street and one on the actual property. It'll double the amount of trees that we have. For apartment buildings right now, it's based on area. So I think just last year we approved a 500 unit apartment building, but I don't know how many trees are actually there. So, you know, perhaps if there isn't enough land on the <coughs> developments that we're approving to put trees on it, then developers can pay a small portion so that we can buy trees and go put them somewhere else in inside the urban area. These are all thoughts, Your Worship, that, that go through our mind in terms of directing policy and, and I guess making our city more green. So if we're, if we're giving away on, on, on the park in the city a thousand trees a year and we do it for the next 10 years, that's 10,000 trees that we've put into the private, that we put into private homes. If we, uh, if we also take the number of units that are here at 8,500 and we bring that number of trees up to 15,000 instead of maybe 8,000, and we've now added 25,000 trees into our urban area. That's pretty significant from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to accept the density levels because those come from the province. But in the end, I think it's up to us to make it look the way that we think is acceptable. So I'd like to add just, a, I guess, to the report, a fourth recommendation as well that staff bring back some, you know, that staff bring back some, uh, I guess, different ideas in terms of you know policies surrounding trees on, uh, on on housing that we're going to approve okay okay and the seconder is uh, good with that yeah and and just to to add to that and, and we talked about it like if, if you get a development where someone's going in and they're chopping down 30 40 <coughs> trees but they're putting up an apartment building of of 60 units and we're saying okay we, we want one tree per unit you won't be able to put them on that property right. and you might be able to do is, is in lieu of money, just get, give it to us and we will put the trees up for the developers in particular spots, whether it's uh, parks, trails, or a tree giveaway. I think it's a it's a win-win for, for a municipality. It's great, so like tree offsetting, so it doesn't exactly. have to be on site, but it'll be built. And planted. the more units we get, the more yeah. trees we're gonna get. Yeah, no, it's a great idea, great idea. Okay, I've got Councillor uh, Lacoco, then Patel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On page, se uh, page seven, it talks about the MZO um, adding a thousand apartment units. I'm gonna go back to um, my concern about vacation rental units because these apartment buildings that will be in this area can also be vacation rental units. So if we're saying we're putting in a thousand um, rental units, which people are supposed to live in, and then all of a sudden they can be converted into VRUs, we're gonna have a problem. So we have to be able to um, have some sort of tracking system about what's uh, for someone to live in and what's going to be a vacation rental unit. And it talks about um, the Go, tra Go Transit Station. Is the inclusionary zoning in the Go Transit Station still allowable through, pla through um, Bill 23? We can maybe find that from staff. Um, yeah, take a stab at it. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, it's a transit hub, so inclusionary zoning is a possibility. But I'll pass it over to the planner. Uh, yeah, through you, um, uh, uh, your worship. Uh, j I just wanted to point out that uh, it's uh, as I identified in the uh, report, it's uh, five percent. Uh, the city actually has a, a greater goal of uh, of up to forty percent for affordable housing, and that's something uh, that uh, you know, we'll be looking at. Uh, uh, in our future work in implementing the housing uh, study guidelines. Okay, thank you. So that does answer that. But I'm still stuck on these number of units that are going to be put in um, commercial areas that can be vacation rental units. What is the plan so we know that? We don't want to go and approve 100 units and then all of a sudden they're all vacation rental mm -hmm. units. It's not helping um, with our residential and it's creating more um, VRUs. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do this? 
uh, staff here who's at uh, Andrew, you want to start off, Mr. Bryce? Uh, yeah, yeah, through your, your worship, uh, for, for the, um, it's uh, only certain zones that a vacation rental unit would be permitted. That's general commercial and tourist commercial, central business commercial. Uh, number one, they have to get a license uh, for, uh, through the city clerk to operate a vacation rental unit. And number two, they have to, the, the current zoning requires two spaces per vacation rental unit. That is often above what uh, these developments can provide on site. Uh, so the tracking of it uh, would be through uh, the licenses. Okay, through the mayor, I guess, to Mr. Bryce. When a development comes to us, 100 units, we, we, um, we approve 100 units. No talk of vacation rental units at that point because that's a, a use later on. So at the time, it could be a year prior, we approve it. Then they decide they want to do vacation rental units. They go through um, the parking. And let, let's take Queen Street. That's commercial. They, they can put the VRUs there. But when we approve the 1,000 residential units, we don't know they're going to be VRUs later. Later on, they come for the license, they get the parking. So how, how do we reconcile a thousand units we're thinking we're getting for residential, and then later on we find out they've turned into vacation rental units? Mm -hmm. So Mr. Brace, if it's in a zoning that is permitted, like tourist commercial or business commercial or, you know, so what do you do in this case? If we're build, allowing an apartment to be built and they want to use it as, so I know what you're saying, they got to be licensed. Mm -hmm. So, so, but if it's allowed, you know, and there's enough parking, what, what, what are our, what are our options in that case? Oh, okay. Get you, I'm get not, next. Hold on. When we're done here. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can uh, offer an option. Like uh, in, in a lot of cases, the uh, the parking requirements, uh, you know, will limit the number of vacation rental units they can locate. Uh, for instance, downtown, uh, residential units are required to have one parking spot uh, per per unit. Uh, that would be, uh, and there's two parking spots required for a vacation rental unit. Uh, so the developer will have to provide substantially more parking. Uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a development that has vacation rental units. Okay, so if they can provide the extra parking, they're now going to be vacation rental units and we put a thousand in our inventory to say that it's residential units. And I just wanna make a comment, at the last committee of adjustment meeting, they reduced the amount of parking units, uh, parking spaces, they reduced it there. It didn't come to council, so we're saying, oh, you need two, but then it went to committee of adjustments and it got reduced there. So we, we have to put something in place. I know there's nothing right now in place, but we have a thousand residential units and we're adding it to our supply and then they're turning into something different later on. It could be a year later, it could be a two years later. They apply for a license, they get the parking or they don't get the parking and then they can't be. But how, how are we as a city reconciling with all of that when the developer's saying you have a thousand residential units. Oscar, our CAO wants to weigh in on this one. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's a challenge for the reconciliation at the end of the day. I think the intent of the pledge and the intent of the legislation, Niagara Falls is unique. There's not as much demand for, you know, they make these, these rules and pledges kind of on a provincial wide basis. Um, and uh, so what we would, you know, what we can do is monitoring if there are change in uses through the licensing, we could maybe kind of go back and manually uh, take a look at that if we wanted to uh, nail down that number, that 8,000 uh, number, um, you know, to report back to the government, we could try to do that. But it would only be done through the licensing at the end of the day. So um, if they license it <laughs> as a VRU, we can then go and see if that was part of our 8,000 uh, unit pledge. Uh, but. Other than that, there's not much that uh, can be done, uh, you know, going, you know, going forward for the reconciliation. Okay, thank you. My next question is about the um, investigate the appropriateness of the Park Street affordable housing. We were supposed to have a certain number of affordable housing on Park Street. Uh, I know I've talked with the CAO before. We are reconsidering it maybe possibly because of the university that they're going to need student housing. We approve that for affordable housing and now we might be making units for um, students. So stu students are one thing, but we need affordable housing for our residents. So that sort of goes to my whole thing. And, and there's nothing stopping those from being VRUs either because they're in the, in the, the right area. You're right, it's this 
gray area of this anomaly that, that, we, that we have right now. But, but we've made, made no decisions to change at this point, right? It's still as it was, Mr. CAO? Uh, yeah, through the, uh, through the chair. Yeah, no, that's something that would come back. It's in discussions with the region uh, and the region's overall housing strategy. Uh, a report will be coming back to council, uh, but uh, um, you know, for decision going forward on Park Street, we're gonna we're gonna change uh, our approach to Park Street because the original approach to the RFP, what we were going to give as incentives were essentially taken away by Bill or made off not taken away, they were made an automatic by Bill uh, 109 and Bill 23. Uh, so the original plan that the region and the city had come up with no longer applies because of uh, the emphasis of affordable housing uh, in the Bill 109, Bill 23 legislation. Uh, but that will be a report for uh, in the future for council. Okay, and just bringing it up because it is in there saying to investigate the appropriateness of Park Street, so that's why I brought it up. Okay, I really have a challenge with this vacation rental unit and I, if we can try to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, especially in this area, if we keep saying we're going to add residential units and then they all become vacation rental units, where are we? I know, I know. I've got uh, Councillor Thompson and then Councillor New Estate. Well, we, uh, zoning is uh, what we have. And we had an, uh, an apartment in the Sterling restaurant. Um, about uh, five or six, seven uh, stories, and um, we zoned it for vacation rentals. And and if we don't do that, they can't do that in a, an apartment or a multi-building. So we have the control over zoning uh, if we permit it, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Newstay. Can't we legally put uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to address uh, Councillor Lococo's um, concern, and I think it's, it's extremely valid. Can we not have some type of legal sanction put on any development that's going there that can ever be used for a vacation rental or some, there has to be ways around it so it doesn't affect affordable this is a CAO or a needy question? Probably though. needy. <laughs> well, <laughs> or maybe, I, I'm sorry. I'll start and someone else can chip it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's a legal use if it's done through zoning. You cannot, you know, I would not want to start getting into what a property owner who paid for their building or house can or cannot do with their property if it's legal to do it and us put a further restriction uh, outside of it. Uh, we have pretty tight zoning rules and pretty tight rules around licensing of that so it's an appropriate use of the property uh, but it uh, but to get into an exclusion of a use of a private property is a whole different legal standard that uh, would be very difficult I think to defend so I think uh, excluding a use becomes a much more difficult position for a city to maintain if it's zoned appropriately but I'll have legal counsel. Ms. Pinarthi, uh, any feedback for us? Um, I agree with the comments that were made uh, so far. I mean, the language within the um, zoning bylaw, as our director of planning has mentioned, um, for a lot of these residential units, because there are limitations on the parking spaces that are significantly smaller than what a minimum parking requirement is for vacation rental, that in itself is almost like a built-in restriction um, or a built-in um, conflict right between the zoning for the residential requirements as well as the vacation rental unit requirements so by just by default one of these residential units will not qualify for a VRU is what I heard if that assists okay. yes Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and just on that, as I said, the Committee of Adjustment, they made a reduction of parking for a VRU. So we might have certain things in place, but then it goes to Committee of Adjustments and we have no, no say to it and they, they got around the parking. So I, I want to keep that in, in mind as well. Mr. Bryce wanted to weigh in too. He had his hand can't Oh, um, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Just to answer the early question, uh, the, that 8,700 units is across about 63 
developments uh, across the city that uh, the council's approved in the last uh, few years. Majority of those are in residential zones that do not permit vacation rental units. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so, Councillor Newstake, back to you. Didn't know if you had any more or anything. No, that was it. Were there any other? Yes, Councillor Patel. Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I want to add to something that uh, Councillor Strange and Councillor Peter Angelo said earlier about the policies. Uh, I really agree with the two trees per property, but some properties do not have enough space in the backyard to put a second tree. So what we can maybe add in a policy that that developer has to put that tree off site, maybe site of our choosing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we're yep. That's yep. Something That's exactly like that. They don't want to add it on site, then they have to pay to buy a tree and we'll put it somewhere else. Okay. Perfect. Yep. And, Thank you. And just and just to that point, we're talking about trees that are. 10 years old, not seedlings either. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna to survive to yep. more mature. Yep, sounds good. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Baldinelli. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for you. Uh, I love the tree planting idea. Um, I think that currently our weather patterns and changes within our beautiful earth are changing too quickly to wait another 100 years for a tree to develop or 50 years. I think that if you look at a property and we have many of them around here that have well-developed trees, you know, they're just taking down homes because they want to put in a lot of condos and stuff like that. If we can work with planners to ensure that the current trees that they have there and the canopies that they have, which will provide shade and coolness and all the water drainage problems, a lot of them go away. I mean, they take the topsoil out and maybe leave it there instead of trucking it somewhere else. I mean, we should be looking at saving what we have because there's a neural network underneath that ground that we don't see. And we have to keep that network there. I mean, you cut down five, five trees in your back area, next thing you know, you have a flood. You didn't realize the trees soaked up so much water. So if we can work with developers to keep current canopies and still have development, is what the way to go instead of taking from what we have here, there's a 200-year-old tree or a 100-year-old tree or a 50-year-old tree, and then planting it somewhere else. It doesn't make any sense to me. Natural development is it, you know? So that's something that we should consider working with developers instead of clear cutting everything i think they did that down on dorchester road by dorchester and the highway mm -hmm. clear cut of the old zapatelli place and it's gone i mean there was so many trees there now they're taking all the topsoil out so why didn't we work with development to keep that canopy there? Mm -hmm. it looked beautiful we could still pay the development there you know it could have went up three or four stories instead of having one story or whatever they are building there but those are things we should consider instead of replanting mm -hmm. and waiting too long because I won't be around 2015, mm -hmm. and weather patterns are going to change. And I want something good for my kids, and your kids, and everybody else's kids. That's why. Be so. No. <laughs> yeah, being very optimistic. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, Councillor. Uh, good comments. Okay, so I think we've had a, a good uh, discussion here. So we've already moved and seconded the recommendation with the fourth. Um, amendment that Councillor Peter Angelo put on the floor. We've already discussed it. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. One opposed. Thank you for that. Um, are we there? We go. Are we there? Oh, yeah, we are there. Okay. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Councillor Peter Angelo. Second by Councillor Patel. Any sp yes, Councillor Lacoco. Um, poll 8.1, the 4621 St. Clair Avenue. I, I spoke with um, Ms. Pinardi. Did I say it right? I'm sorry. Um, I, I spoke with her uh, earlier today. One of the things that I would really like to see is notification. I know it was a public notice in the newspaper, but the businesses and the residents along Queen Street that <coughs> back on to this, quote, laneway, which is not a legal laneway, they weren't notified. I know we don't have to because it's not a laneway. Their, their properties go to the back. I just want to be proactive and transparent when we're doing these things and notify them to let them know what's happening because they're not going to be able to go in off of St. Clair to the backs of their property. They're going to have to go around the other way. So th that, that was my only comment on that. And then on 8.2 Bell Canada, mm -hmm. I was wondering if the city could charge a fee for Bell to put their equipment on our city right away. We're always looking for ways of making money. Bell is going to put their equipment on our property and they're going to make a lot of money. Could we not charge them a fee? 
Uh, yeah, Mr. Nickel. Yeah, thank you, uh, three, Mr. Mayor. The, the city um, has a franchise agreement. We call it franchise agreements or municipal access agreements. Generally, that's not something that is encouraged by municipalities, and the Telecommunications Act has some rules around what we can and cannot do with respect to those permits. Um, here, they're putting in over 500 kilometers of new, new plant, and they're willing to pay for the staff that are needed to permit those locations. So. Um, what we ask of Bell is to be upfront and to record those locations so that when we need to come back and get locations again in future, they're at the table and they're forthcoming with that information. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, any other? No? Okay, so if there's no other items on the consent agenda to discuss, we'll call the vote to approve them all collectively. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. So we are on to nine, and um, the clerk has suggested that we could approve 9.1 through 9.4. Um, uh, yeah. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Neustag, uh, that we approve 9.1, and I'll say what they are really quickly. 9.1, flag raising for the 13th annual Italian Heritage Month. Uh, that'll be uh, Friday, June the 9th. Proclamation request Crohn's and Colitis for the month of November. Proclamation request Knights of Columbus Week, April 23rd through 30th of this year. And proclamation request Save Soil Movement, March 21st, 2023. And if there's no discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. So we're on to item 10, communications and comments of the city clerk. And the clerk has suggested that we receive and file 10.1 through 10.7. What's the will of council? Councillor Strange makes the motion, second by Councillor Thompson, that we receive and file 10.1 through 10.7. Yes, Mr. Clerk. I just wanted to provide a, a quick update to 10.1. The BIA downtown uh, had a meeting last night and they had a vote to uh, keep Mr. Phil Ritchie as the chair. Uh, the previous vote uh, was discovered that they didn't provide enough notice uh, before that vote was taken. Uh, so when they did the vote last evening, uh, he is still uh, listed as the chair of the downtown BIA. Uh, there wasn't really any direction for council to do anything with that other than receive and file, but I just wanted to make sure they were aware of that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yes, Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I was at that microphone board meeting last night, and uh, it takes two thirds of, um, of the majority of the board to change a, a motion like a chairman of the board. And uh, that didn't happen. Um, I have some serious concerns about what, what is going on with the BIA. Um, uh, Mr. Ritchie wants to have uh, a meeting sometime at the end of March, and uh, it was revealed to us last night that the uh, BIA will be bankrupt on the 16th of March. It's not functioning very, very well. And uh, there is a lot of uh, conflict. There's a lot of threats to the uh, executive director, uh, death threats. Um, it, it, it's, it's becoming somewhat of a nightmare to the point where the uh, executive director is, is uh, she's a mess. Like, things are not going well. I help, try to help understand them that I don't represent anybody in the downtown BIA. I don't represent the BIA. I represent what's best for city council. And I firmly believe that the decision that was made was that he be uh, taken off as the chair of the board. And uh, to accept anything else, uh, that information did not come from the board, it came from Mr. Ritchie, right? And I'm sorry, he was taken off the chair position. So uh, I don't know what, what that means or we go with it. 
But uh, uh, at this point, as far as I'm concerned and as far as council should be concerned, Mr. Ritchie is not the chair of the downtown BIA. Who, who would you suggest, who is the chair? Of the well, we're working on that. Okay. Um, and it, it, it's a process. And I'm telling you right now, the majority of people on that board have no idea of what the Constitution says about what the bylaws say. It's very, very frustrating that they feel they can make this decision, which is contrary to the, to the rules and regulations of the BIA. But I, I strongly believe that... Said he's still yeah, I'm sure you still have the floor, Councillor. Well, I, I strongly believe that the, that the uh, BIA rightfully uh, voted uh, Mr. Ritchie off of the chair. I've got, it. I've got uh, next Councillor Neustag and Councillor, was it Peter Angelo? Yep, thank you. And through you, um, Your Worship, and to Councillor Campbell, I'm not a member of the downtown BIA, so I'm going to speak with, um, with all due respect to you, but I'm going to speak from a business point of view and from being very familiar with um, BIAs. We have been inundated um, since we've got on council with the downtown, the members of the downtown BIA, their concerns. Um, and again, not being a member, I, I'm maybe speaking out of turn, but I'm trying to figure out what's happened. This is the fourth time that any that we've heard from the downtown BIA. We have many other BIAs in the city, and nobody's come forward. So there definitely seems to be a, a major issue. Um, my concern as a res, as a councillor is that we have a lot of exciting things going on in the downtown, and we need to have this resolved. Not that I have any answer or answers for it, but we have the the university and the go train. Um, but more importantly, we have businesses down there trying to operate, and bus operating a business is challenging enough than to have all of this. So there's definitely concerns of one group or the other, um, trying to figure out what's going on. I think um, I think it really comes down to what perception of the role of the BIA is. So there's um, there's I think two models happening here. There's one where the BIA serves at or the at the pleasure of the businesses. And it seems like downtown is kind of reversed a bit that the businesses are serving at the pleasure of the, the BIA, which is a little bit contradictory. And why I'm saying that is because when you're hearing from business owners, business owners that have been there for a long time, they're completely frustrated. They feel that they don't have a voice. That is concerning. Um, there's all this legal people being threatening and legal suits going back and forth. I don't understand that at all. That should not be happening. Um, the B, like I said, the BIA is supposed to be there to help and support, but that kind of um, going back and forth. Um, I, I am concerned about how the budget is being presented, not going back to the general membership. All the other BIAs <coughs> go to an annual, we sit as a board, we design, um, we have our priorities, we set out our plan, and then we put a budget to it and we go out to um, the general membership the, and hold an AGM. With that, we have a discussion, they approve it, and it comes back to council for a vote. All the other BIAs are doing that. Downtown um, is not has excluded the general membership from, from voting on it. Um, some of the other, um, you know, having security guards at the meetings, we've never seen anything like it. So there's definitely an issue here. I don't know how it gets resolved. Um, but I, I think we have a serious issue that really needs attention and to calm um, people down there. So. Um, I think one of the motions I'd like is to see that they go back to their former constitution like the other BIAs and have the budget go back to the general membership. I think that might help solve some of the problems. Thank you. Good comments, appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, it's been ongoing for a long time. This has been uh, a long time. It just shifts, it's like a pendulum, one way or then the other way. Just it's like the McCoys and the Hatfields, you know, it just never ends it seems, you know. Um, I've got Councillor Peter Angelo up next. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, I guess I was just going to say, I don't know what to believe at this point. Um, I mean, I get emails both ways. Um, it, it's difficult to vote on things. I mean, I often say to people, I'm only as good as the information I have in front of me. If the information I have in front of me is not right, then I'm not going to make a good decision. Um, it, is there any way that, you know, 
votes that deal with the downtown can simply just be deferred until we get some type of verification from staff who's running the BIA. Um, I, I was hoping that we could defer it, you know, especially the budget, and let the new board deal with it. Uh, you know, since that happened, uh, I mean, again, I don't even want to reiterate the information because I don't know that it's correct. So maybe we can have our clerk actually give us an update and at our next meeting, you know, ho hopefully we have a budget that we can pass for the downtown BIA. I think we got to get on with something. It's just a matter of, I want credible information in front of me, Your Worship. I'd be curious, yes, I was gonna come to our- uh, Before our Mr. next Chairman. meeting, which is at the end of March, uh, they will be bankrupt. That's, that's reality. They will be bankrupt. And um, there was some question whether they could get partial uh, monies from the city uh, to, to, to uh, negate the possibility of them going bankrupt. I prefer that. I, I would too, but there's a certain percentage of people on that board that want to cut the budget, which means there will be no Santa Claus parade. There will be no uh, Canada Day parade because the monies won't be there for the BIA to run it. And we've made an arrangement with the BIA to operate those, those operations at a much reduced cost than the city of Niagara Falls was putting out uh, to, to hold them. And there's people on that board that are there that want to simply cut the budget. And it takes two thirds of the BIA membership, not membership, board members, to uh, change something like the budget, for example. So uh, 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 I don't know what to say, but I, I think that it's going to be a process. And uh, yes, they're going to need help from the city, but the uh, BIA, as far as from my perspective, uh, made a, a choice based on, if you read this letter from the BIA, uh, Mr. Ritchie has uh, restricted the democratic process. Uh, he has attempted to supersede the board of management by unilaterally speaking on behalf of the board. He's, he's really uh, created a situation that that he should not be the uh, chair of the board. Yeah, and I just want to, by the way, keep us focused. We're not dealing with the budget yet. That's coming up later uh, after that. Right now, this is just consent agenda. So that'll be our next discussion point. So uh, Councillor uh, Newestag and then Lococo. I, I think the whole, again, going back to the downtown, I think there's a, a, a it's indicative in terms of what it is the role of the BIA. No other BIAs run Santa Claus parades or um, candidate parades, and it seems like members of the downtown BIA, half of them don't want to do that. So I don't know if they have to go back and figure out what their mandate is and what the role of the BIA, and they have to have a consensus on that. I think that's the, the crux of this whole issue here. Um, other BIAs aren't doing, aren't running that way, so, um, and there doesn't seem to be any issues with the other BIA. So maybe if they can figure out what they what is expected and what they really are going to do, um, then maybe it will settle down. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As I think it was said multiple times, I don't think we have the right information to make a decision. Um, I'm wondering if through the clerk, the CAO, the executive director of the BIA, the chair or the not chair uh, or the past chair or the vice chair could get together and go through some of these are simple facts number of votes dates notification and figure all of that out and let's call a special meeting so they don't go bankrupt and that there can be a plan to move forward because 
we keep getting all of these emails and we don't have all of the information. And some of it is just basic facts, number of votes, when the dates were, when the notification was. We've all read the emails that have gone back and forth and we need some sort of mediator or facilitator to figure out what it is before council can vote on it. And yes, there's some issues about what different BIAs do and what they don't. Um, you don't want to see a BIA go bankrupt if, if they don't have to, but if we can have some sort of facilitation to find out these facts and move forward, can we call a special meeting next, next, uh, next Tuesday, March 7th? It's possible, it's possible. I mean, it'd be nice if we could deal with this. Yes, Mr. Ciego? Just, just as an alternative suggestion, I think, you know, obviously council has expressed a desire to get the facts and that might take a little bit of time. If there is a concern and this is news to me, uh, I'm assuming it's not a bankruptcy issue. I assume technically they just run out of cash or it's a cash flow issue for the BIA. Um, if, uh, if council wants to uh, provide a bit of a lifeline, you can give the CAO and uh, uh, the county solicitor the authority to and the treasurer the authority to loan uh, an amount to the BIA uh, you know and then that we we can just then deduct it off of their future payments because they get a tax levy that then that way we can make sure we get it back uh, the issue is if they don't provide a budget to us we can't levy uh, the amount so we can uh, we can certainly do that and then levy the amount um, uh, later in the year that may take a little bit of pressure off uh, uh, the BIA so if if council wants to uh, provide delegated authority to that staff can handle that emerging issue um, so that's <clears throat> one compartment the other thing I just want to provide uh, just a little bit of council to council uh, two different spellings uh, that uh, the BIA is an independent organization uh, and I don't want to, uh, the clerk or uh, the CAO or the Treasury put in a position where we're making decisions on behalf of the BIA. Uh, my, my instructions to the clerk has been he can provide advice uh, to the BIA uh, if requested, but we provide advice to the BIA. We don't uh, go in and um, take any action. So, so we can certainly meet with them. Uh, we can provide advice, uh, but that is really legally uh, no different than a library board or other things. You know, we can provide advice, our interpretation of the Municipal Act, uh, but they have to make those decisions. They're a constituted organization. And, and um, you know, we, like I said, we, we, I just want to be clear with Council, the only thing we're really doing is providing advice. The loan I can take, um, if Council so decides, uh, you'd have to put, you would have to, uh, and I'll check with the clerk, you would have to waive uh, procedural order because it wasn't a motion that was brought before council uh, in a normal basis so you'd have to do that put the motion on the floor to give me delegated give staff delegated authority and then vote on that if that is something that uh, council so wishes so that we can avoid an emergency meeting on the BIA thank you okay, thank you councillor how much are we talking about for the loan uh, through the chair, I, I, we would have to find out. My assumption is it's probably a two-month like operational thing. So we, um, so their budget is. I'm going to look at Tiffany while she clicks through, and I'll try to delay. Um, but their, uh, but we normally allocate their funding four times a year based upon the levy, right? So it would be, you know, we would essentially be probably advancing one quarter of their budget, which we would get back through the. Uh, um, you know, through their through the levy that would happen anyway. So I'm not worried about repayment because I know we can just tax and levy that. That would help tremendously. I think their budget was about a million dollars, correct? Nine hundred thousand. Nine hundred thousand. Okay, so yeah, it was nine hundred two. So we'd be talking two hundred thousand dollars, which would just be a timing thing. We would be normally advancing uh, funds in June anyways to all the BIAs. So who would have the authority to utilize those funds if you have a board who has a chair and doesn't have a chair? Like who is the responsible person, authorized person? Like I think we really need to get all of that worked out before giving money to somebody who, who who's going to use that money. Well, For what? I, they, have, they have expenditures, they have employees currently, they have, uh, you know, it's no different than uh, there's municipalities 
you know, that can go forward with an unapproved budget. And what happens is there's a restriction that says you can't spend more than 50% of your prior year budget. And they have an executive director there that is, is not the board. So we can, you know, we can get from them what they would spend it on and approve the loan for the spending, which would probably be mostly salaries, rent, uh, and those type of pre-approved programs. Uh, you know, and, and then it's really up for, for their board to uh, decide. It may take a little bit to go through, but I think the clerk has made some determinations on, on what has happened procedurally. I just don't. You know, my concern is my concern is you call an emergency meeting. You may not have all the facts, and and you may still have some disputes. So this may just give a little bit of time for their board to meet with us. Uh, a week is a very tough thing to get two organizations together. Uh, through the chair, I did look it up. Their budget was a million dollars for 2022, but that included external revenues of 591,000. The actual tax levy amount was 406,000. So then it would be a hundred thousand. So what what would be our motion then? Um, we're not there yet. I I know I'm just sort of trying to to work. Why don't we it. wait because we we we're talking out of context. Okay, out of so I'm not talking about the budget now. I'm talking about procedure okay. about this letter about removing the chair. How are we to determine what is accurate? What happened? We're not doing anything. This is received and filed. This is not. They're not asking us to do. We have no say over who their chair is. Okay, and I understood we were receiving and filed, and then the clerk gave us an update, and then we went on to something else. So that's what I'm speaking. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Clark. Yeah, through you, Your Worship, and I think Councillor Campbell is right. That update came from uh, Mr. Ritchie this morning. Um, I, I tend to base my updates more on uh, what I received from the uh, executive director. Um, you know, Mr. Ritchie has also told me in the past that only only correspondence from him alone would go on the council agenda. So I'm I'm a little leery to uh, to take what he sends um, as as fact. Uh, bottom line, like the mayor says, this is just to receive and file. Uh, but also, I'm reminded of the mayor's comments back in December when he uh, told representatives from the BIA here that uh, council is not the referee. And as the CEO has pointed out, staff are here to give advice, but we're not here to go in and clean up their mess and decide who's right and who's wrong. They need to do that themselves um, in this short amount of time that they've been together as this new board. Uh, I've only seen the problems get worse, uh, just like you've seen a lot of the emails come through. I'm getting a lot of those as well. So I think right now for 10.1, it's a matter of receive and file. We'll probably get into more of a lengthy discussion when we reach 11.2 when they've submitted their budget, and I have some comments on that later as well. Yes, Councilor. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. To that point, as long as it's understood that 10.1 is receiving and file only, that it's not approving it or denying it, it's just receive and file, yeah. and then we can yes. talk about the rest yeah, later. Exactly right. Okay, so we already have a motion seconded to receive and file 10.1 through 10.7. We'll call mm -hmm. the vote. All those in favor? Yeah. Okay, opposed? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. So now we go on to 11. And Mr. Clerk, where are we at with 11.1? These people have been waiting, eating popcorn, oh, sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait for the white smoke and the black smoke to see what happened. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to look to to staff here, or, or do we have an update uh, that we can provide? Uh, so through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the clerk, I currently need to verify a vote with one of the members of council, if I might cross the floor to do so. Yes, of course. Um, and just to make sure. Yes, verify and away. And then um, we'll be pretty well, I'll need another five minutes or okay. so. So then, oh, no, that'll be at least five. Now yeah, we can budget. identify who had bad. Not for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not for sure. Everyone else. Who had the bad? Awkward. 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 It's a hanging chair. Oh. See that vanishing ink again? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Clerk? Well, perhaps uh, we can just continue then with uh, Section 11, Communications and Comments of the City Clerk. Uh, these are broken down into various uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, the first one, uh, since we were just talking about it, the Downtown Board of Management, 
through their executive director, uh, did forward on correspondence that uh, on the meeting of February 8th, uh, they did go ahead and pass their budget for 2023. Uh, I know that the uh, that Mr. Ritchie uh, argues that uh, they didn't pass that evening, uh, but from what I've been told, uh, he tried to um, uh, adjourn the meeting by himself as the chair at the time uh, by just leaving the meeting. Uh, if if uh, the mayor was to leave today's meeting uh, and we still had quorum, we would continue with the meeting. And what? that is what I've been told by the executive director that uh, the meeting continued with quorum and the budget was passed. So the recommendation here is it's for council's consideration. Uh, you know, based on everything that was just discussed a few minutes ago, it might be a good idea to defer that. I know there's been attempts to uh, have more meetings, to, to restart the AGM process, to consider the constitution, uh, to re-look re at uh, how they approve their budgets. So maybe uh, the BIA needs a little bit more time to, uh, to get things in order. I'll leave it up to the will of council as to what they want to do with tonight's budget. Uh, that's been submitted by the downtown BIA, whether they uh, defer it like they did, like you did back in December when it was first brought forward, and give the BIA more time uh, to sort this out. Uh, that's the will of council. Okay, Councillor Newstead. So I can make a motion to defer that budget, the downtown. Well, the Is that what you're saying? If they're going to have a cash flow problem, we may want to give them a lifeline. Can we still do that but defer their budget? I just. Yes, okay, I'd like to make a motion to defer it. I'm just afraid that if um, we don't do it and we push it on the ones that aren't, because they're definitely split down there, we're gonna have more problems. We're just gonna add fuel to this fire. So um, like the, uh, Mr. Matson said, I think they need to go back and start settling it out, settling it themselves. Now, Mr. Clerk, or Mr. Cio, how do we address the uh, lifeline if we defer it? Um, as I said, I, I believe if you defer it, we would normally be giving uh, a payment to them in March. So a deferral would stop that payment. So as a substitution, uh, you would have to give us authority to provide them with a loan of approximately $100,000 to be dealt with by staff. Okay, so then can I make a motion that we have them defer their budget, but we give them $100,000 as a... Like a draw on a draw their, on their yeah. BIA. And I know in the past when Maine Ferry didn't have theirs done in time, we had we were given monies until um, our AGM was yep. was put in place. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we've got the, the motion for deferral with a hundred thousand dollar lifeline to the BIA. I've got Councillor Peter Angelo seconded and wants to speak to it, and I know Councillor Coco, Councillor Patel would like to speak as well. I'm just seconding. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Happy to second the motion. Um, the other part I wanted to bring up is the issue of correspondence. Um, I, I don't know whether as a council we can, um, I guess, set out a, a demand that only one person or one body actually communicates with us because what I find right now is we're getting communication from probably three or four different sides. We're getting it from, uh, you know, the ED, we're getting it from the chair, not chair. We're getting it from two sides of the membership uh, that are down in the BIA. It would be nice to have some type of communication that we knew was was valid. That's all. And I don't know. Uh, maybe the clerk can advise us on you know who to choose. Uh, but that should be the correspondence that we receive and adopt as our official correspondence. Mr. I would agree with the councillor, uh, certainly, and uh, if I was to make a choice myself, it would be from the executive director. Mm -hmm. She's been hired by the BIA. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, she's, she, she's almost like, uh, and like, like the clerk uh, in that position to keep things running administratively. So uh, since she's been hired by the BIA, in my opinion, she's the best voice. Yes. I agree. I would agree too. I agree too. Yeah. So, are you done, Councillor uh, Pinarzo? No, I'll, I'll add that to the motion. Yeah. Why don't you do it then? Just make it clear. Yeah. Is the seconder? Well, no, she made the motion. I was the seconder. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe she that's the, the the mover. Would you agree with that, uh, uh, Councillor Newstead? Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I know the city's not supposed to be the referee. I just don't want to hand over money and not know what's going to happen. I'd like to put as part of the motion that we have some sort of communication with them to figure out what happened, figure out procedurally what happened, number of votes, two thirds, what day, all of that. I don't want to just hand over money and then us not figure out what's going on. Bringing the correspondence into it is great. And, and even the letters that have come, it's the Niagara Falls Downtown Board of Management. Another one says the Downtown Board of Management, Niagara Falls. Nobody's signing it. We're getting emails from different people. So I think it's good to, to outline that uh, communication process. But I think we have to have some sort of um, reconciliation agreement from the BIA that they'll do that if we forward them the money to well, figure I, out what's going on. And I don't disagree with you. I just think procedurally, <clears throat> we, uh, they are there because council made them a BIA, right? They're an extension of the, of the city and they follow their, their procedural bylaw and they create a board and the board does a budget and approves a budget and they bring it to us and our job is to approve it or not approve it. You know, so now this is becoming conflated and it, the, the water is becoming muddy and it's murky. And, and really, I, I think, right, chair, not chair, uh, you know, who's, the only consistent is their, their um, executive director, and she is excellent and on her game, and whoever the chair is, she's reported to, and the board she's working with, but I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think our, we don't want him to, I don't think, my opinion, that our clerk dealing in the minutia of what they're doing, right? The job is their board, communicated with their executive, to our clerk, puts it on our agenda, we vote for it or against it. Right, we can't be detectives for the BIAs, regardless, because it's a levy, not I, our I money. I understand what it, you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's why, because the more we get involved, the more we're gonna be involved. But we have different information from many different places. How do we determine what's <coughs> right? It's like Schrodinger's cat. Is it alive, is it dead, is it a chair, is it not a chair? Like, we have to determine that. And if, if we don't have the proper information, that even Councillor Campbell brought up about the money, we don't have a request from the board for the money. Like, th th there's a lot of different things. Everyone's trying to help, and mm -hmm. we have all these different um, perceptions about what happened, and some of them are facts and some of them aren't. I, I just don't feel right handing over money until we at least have a conversation about what happened. Yeah, and I agree with you, but... I'd I, like that to be part of the motion, then. Yeah, we can report that. Well, um, as far as part of the motion, I don't know how... Uh, I don't know what you're asking exactly. Like, how is the clerk responsible for determining all of the procedural happenings of the board? I mean, I'm not exactly sure. No, I, I don't think he's responsible. It would be nice to maybe dig through some of it and find out and maybe give your opinion. You, you know procedural better than most of us. Okay. Um, it, it's just hard for me to say, okay, here, take this money. And... We're I'd, I'd rather focus my attention on, on moving this forward, not digging up what's happened in the past. Uh, to me, that would be, uh, I'd be putting in uh, days of overtime, countless days of overtime. So, so how do we determine about passing their budget or who's, well, I like think we've deferred it, I understand that, but now what? Well, my, my, and again, I don't want to put words in the clerk's mouth, but I think the clerk will look at what they did in discussion with the executive director to see if they followed because, and, and in consultation with our council rep, and that's why we have a council rep. It's to be a liaison and our eyes and our ears and come back to council. And that's, to me, that's the triangle, you know, of how we're gonna, between the clerk, between the executive director and our council liaison. And then I'm, I personally, I'm willing to move forward at that point. I don't wanna do a forensic audit of, of what they're doing downtown. I don't mean a forensic audit. I just mean about the process of the AGM, the budget, the chair, that's not really a forensic audit. Those are basic procedural. Yeah, Mr. CAO. Because the budget is being deferred because council wants some additional information, the deferral causes a cash flow problem for the BIA. By deferring this budget to March 21st, if they have a cash flow issue, you'll give us the authority to loan it. Trust me, I'm not giving out money easy. So they'll have to actually prove financial need and all that stuff. That's why it's the delegated authority of staff. When it comes back on March 21st, staff will put a, a report on it based upon the clerk's information that he's obtained you know, through uh, the executive director and just put a factual um, summary of the report attached to their budget to address council's questions and concerns here. Um, it may be limited in scope. We'll just say, here's who we talked to, here was the minutes of the meeting, you know, 
and just leave it at that. Um, and then that way council would have, you know, council is deferring at this point in time because there's a lack of information. So we'll just provide that information um, with as limited effort as we can without getting into uh, the weeds as much. Uh, the delegated authority for the loan, like I said, we'd only do it if it's required. If it's not required, I'm not loaning the money. Um, and then if the budget's, once the budget is passed, we, we normally forward, we flow money at that point in time. So if it gets passed in March, the money will flow in April at that point in time. If it's deferred further, well then you'll have to cross that bridge when you get to it. So I think to address your concerns, Councillor, we'll attach a report to their resubmitted budget. It may be the exact same budget that you have here tonight, just with some more factual information around it to address the conflicting emails that we're seeing. Okay, thank you. And just one final comment. In one of the last emails, it said that the ED was away for three weeks. So if the ED is away for three weeks, our next council meeting is three weeks from now, March 21st. How are we getting any information? Uh, Mr. Clerk, I'm sorry to keep coming back to you on this. Yeah, I'd, I would say we'd have to delay. I, I don't know what her absence is, uh, whether it's vacation or sick. Uh, but did you get that letter from yeah. the executive director? Uh, I got so many from I don't no. know who. She but might still be willing to meet. She's available. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. You still have the floor, Council. Okay. Um, I guess if she's available, that answers my question. Yes. But I wanted to bring it up because we're no further ahead than we were. Thank you. I talked with her today on the phone. Okay. Thank you yeah. for that. So, Councilor Newestag, I know Councilor Strange, Councilor Patel, mm -hmm. everybody uh, has something. Okay. You got that. <laughs> Quickly, I just want to add that in addition to the. Um, ED of the uh, BIA that also the chair we should be able to have correspondence from the chair as well once we know who the chair once is we know oh, I know but yes is. but we're, we're asking for direction and I agreed to that I'm also saying that we should have that thank you that's everything thank you but for that. as it as it is today we don't have a chair we'll make those decisions after the executive director talks with uh, the clerk Councillor Strange. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, sitting back, listen, Councillor Campbell is our rep on this. He sees what's going on in the meeting. So to go past him and say, oh, I want more information from this, 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 he's our rep there. He knows what he's doing. And we should be getting the information from the executive director. Whether she's away or not, I'm sure she can just email you what the proper protocol was and what happened at that meeting. And I, I don't think whatever we do, we can have a meeting the, the BIA is still going to be split probably for the next oh, yeah. four years. You know what I mean? Because they always have been. So whether it's on the one side or the other, it has to get done. So, you know, I, I believe what, what Councillor Campbell, he's our rep, and we should believe what he's saying. Not go, be, go beyond him and say, okay, we want to scope out exactly what happened in the minutes. He was there at the minutes. He was there at, at that agenda, that, at that meeting. And I appreciate that, but I think the direction we're taking right now is what's necessary to straighten things out. Good. Councillor Patel. Through Mr. Mayor to uh, Councillor Campbell, this is just a recommendation. Uh, every BIA in the city has the two city reps on it, two councillors, and they all run smoothly. And this BIA has a problem. Every meeting there is a problem. It's just not fair for you to take the heat all the time. And they are not very nice to you. And when you see the emails, they are not very kind to Ms. Councillor Campbell. I appreciate what, if I may. Yes. I, yeah. I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah. Um, last term, it was uh, Chris Dabrowski. Uh, this time around, no one put their name in to be that second representative. With respect to uh, the feedback I'm getting and you're getting, yes. a long time ago, a good friend of mine, Derek Sanderson, played a professional hockey. He said to me, Wayne, it doesn't matter what they're saying as long as they're saying something. It doesn't bother me. But the way I see it is like you're just you're getting it from every side. It's just not That's fair. okay, and I appreciate it. I mean. At least they're talking about me, right? Yes. No. Well, well, the way I see it, if you if you want a partner, maybe somebody else can step up if they want to support well, Councilor Campbell. That Mona Patel goes on. No. <laughs> wow. Oh, I'm, I'm just saying that if anybody else is open oh, to else? sit on the thing. <laughs> I don't. We were both on the floor. 
Do we have a motion right now? Yeah. Councilor Neustang, are you? Your, your political career, but we'll set <laughs> No, Councilor Neustang, or because you have. You know, you know the BIA bylaws and stuff. Would you be interested in sitting on the BIA for? Uh, listen, wait a minute. We got a motion on the floor right now. <laughs> yeah. just here. Oh. So, uh, you owe me a beer for getting you out yeah. of that one. Uh, so we do have a motion on the floor that's been seconded, and the motion was basically deferral of the budget, Mr. Clerk, and um, lifeline of up to a hundred thousand. Is that yep, and, and to basically waive the procedural bylaw to then give that authority to staff. Uh, to grant a loan, if required, uh, of approximately $100,000 to draw uh, from their future budget approvals. Okay, everybody understands the motion? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, that's opposed or for it? Opposed, okay. So that is approved, thank you. And that includes uh, the meeting with the CAO? The, the CAO? Well, staff. Yeah, yeah, staff. Yeah, yeah. staff. Yeah, staff. Yeah. I know the CAO is looking for meetings to go to, so he look forward to that, adding it to his list. Um, so how far did we, okay, what did we do, sorry. Mr. Well, I think we may be ready to give some uh, announcement oh. on. 11.1? Yeah. Um, I no? Yes. If you just give us a moment to confer.
All right, folks, we are ready. Drum roll. Okay, so uh, through the chair, uh, just bear with me as I read through these. Uh, just procedurally, what will happen is we'll, we'll announce uh, who the uh, successful candidates are here tonight. There will be a decision that would have to be made on a few of them regarding numbers and ties. I'll leave those till the end. <coughs> and then what will happen is uh, we will just go over and confirm all this, much like an election. Uh, we'll consider these unofficial results. We'll bring back uh, a appointment bylaw at the next meeting of council so that uh, everything can be done uh, officially through the approval of a bylaw. So I'm going to start with the anti-racism committee. Uh, as as uh, council is aware, uh, they made previous decisions to reappoint any members that uh, reapplied for this election. Uh, so we do have a number of, of candidates. <coughs> I'm just going to read uh, some last names here. Abassi, Brown, Darlene, Madum, and uh, Tran. Uh, those, those were the people that had reapplied, so they would be appointed. Uh, as far as adding two additional members, uh, we have uh, Vijay Kapoor and Katie Kumar. Moving on to Committee of Adjustment. Uh, we were looking for five members there to be elected, and they would be Rick Brady, Paul Campagato, Frank Franz, uh, Daniel James Moody, and Lou Stranges. For the Culture Committee, uh, upwards of 12 there, uh, they would be Sherry Armstrong, Deborah uh, Attenborough, uh, Priscilla Brett, Donna Brown, Diane Dubas, Dino Fazio, Angela Minotti, Lori Moffitt, Tracy Satan, uh, Patrick Siriani, Ermina Summers, and Elaine Wallace. For the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, uh, similar to anti-racism, where there would be uh, the reappointment of those members from the last term that had reapplied, uh, being uh, DeLuca, uh, Ertora, uh, Grimond, Khan, uh, Nuegbo, and Terry Berry uh, Portofilio. Sorry about the pronunciations. Uh, and then the three additional members uh, would be Kat Feigard, uh, Marilyn Tian, and uh, Jito Tom Ufu. Municipal Heritage Committee electing eight members there uh, Christian Bell. Uh, Bruno Caria, Mark Iamarino, uh, Jamie Jones, Cynthia Mockery, uh, Darren Schmall, David Servos, and David Vida. Seniors Advisory Committee looking for eight appointments there Elizabeth Del Bianco, uh, Karen Frazier, Ewald uh, Kuzira, Otto Penner. Kathleen Quaquero, Anna Racine, Joe uh, Zabo, and Eileen uh, Tanino Hind. For the Property Standards slash Dangerous Dogs Appeals Committee, uh, we were looking for five members uh, Frank DeLuca, Anna Lee, and uh, Joseph Perasco uh, are the first three. Then there is a three-way tie for, for the remaining two spots. Uh, if council wishes, we could have uh, all six of these members appointed. So the remaining three uh, could be Bruno Caria, uh, Sheila DeLuca, and Kathleen Mann. Uh, it would be my recommendation uh, to just appoint six as opposed to five. Uh, I know in dealing with this uh, Dangerous Dogs Appeals Committee, uh, we have had some uh, challenges in getting members out, uh, so that would certainly assist with that. Um, next, Park in the City Committee, uh, electing up to 14. Here we have 13 members that would be voted in and then a tie for 14th. That would bring them to 15. And I know that uh, staff, uh, uh, Ms. Boldenhauer, had suggested that she would not want to go over 14. We were originally thinking just 12. Uh, maybe the compromise there is just to appoint the top 13. Uh, for which one is that? That is for Park in the City. 
I'm going to read off the 13, and if, if council feels that they want to go uh, to try and break that tie or go to 15, I'll leave that to the will of council. But uh, I'm going to read off top 13, Jan, John Anstruther, Jennifer Baldinelli, Paul Bongers, John Brock Bricotta, uh, Aniko Bizdial, uh, Debbie uh, Th uh, Thatcher, Sheila DeLuca, Frank Four, Paisley Janvery Poole, Patricia Mascarin, Thomas Mingle, John Morocco, and Tina Overstrom. And then lastly, the Accessibility Advisory Committee. This was looking for uh, 10 to 14 members. Um, we have a clear top 12. And if we were to go any higher than that, we would have to add five more, which would bring us to 17. Uh, since they're only looking for 10 to 14, my recommendation would just be to go with that top 12. Uh, I think a, a committee of 17 would be a little large. Uh, so the top 12 there would be Carol Baldinelli, Sandy Bird, uh, Carmelo Carrara, uh, Salida uh, Corcoran, sorry if I'm butchering any of these names, Angela Dumil, uh, Lee Goring, Daniel Hummel, Paisley Janvary Poole, Janet Jessup, uh, Rob, Robert Romanak, uh, Colleen Scott, and Jack Witter. If there's any discussion, I think it would be appropriate to have that. Otherwise, I think we could seek a motion to read all those names or to appoint all those names to the various committees. And again, we would bring a bylaw for final approval at the next meeting. Okay, so we need some direction on three of the committees, I believe. Um, I believe if I got it straight. Um, Mr. Mayor, before you go with that, did we skip the recreation committee? Yeah. 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 He had his grocery list. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was mixed in with the tally sheets there. Uh, so that committee was looking for 14. And we have a clear cut 14. I'll read those off. Uh, Jitthin, I'm not even going to attempt a last name, uh, letter A. Uh, Michael Audibert, uh, Todd Bright, uh, Aniko Bizdil, uh, Christopher Danielli. Sheila DeLuca, Rob Desson, Paisley Janvary Poole, Donna Mills, Amanda McDonald, uh, Lori Primo, Vito Scaringi, Terry Thompson, and Ying Wang. All right, so looks like it was pretty clear with the exception of three committees. Uh, the one was property standard dangerous dogs. The other one was accessibility and park in the city. So Councillor Peter Angelo, I saw you had your hand up and I saw Councillor Newestag also had her hand up. I like 15 on the committee which is part of the city. Okay, so it was 13 or 15 was the, the choice. So you're, okay, so and you're the, the liaison from council on that one? Yeah, we're both co-chairs. Okay, co do you agree with him? I do. Okay, good, that's good. <laughs> well, I just want to like to make sure because he made a funny face when you said that. And then, Dean, are you nuts? And then uh, if I could, uh, just some informal discussion um, uh, regarding the accessibility uh, committee, which was 12 or 17. Is that you, Councillor Campbell? No. No? It's you, Councillor Coco. But I haven't attended a meeting yet because they were waiting for this, so I don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. Who was on it last time? No one. Nobody? No one. Okay. All right. So um, 17 seems like a lot. Who's the staff liaison on that one? Uh, on accessibility? Yes. Oh, it's, it's Jason McLean. Oh, Jason. Okay. But that one is 10 to 14, so that one does so have a range, so, so 12 okay. seems to fit right in Okay, there. so 12 looks like a good number, suggesting. And then the last one, property standards, dangerous dogs. So that was the option of plus three. Right. What's that? Plus one. Yeah, it was either three members or six members, but we were electing up to five, I think. Right. So that would be plus so one if we did all six. To go to six right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So would someone like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion uh, to adopt those three recommendations. But can we know who the people are then? Yep. 
So we'll start with the Park and the City Committee. It would be the 13 that I read off. The additional two members then would be Pat Fotino and Carly Milani. For property standards, uh, I had read off three in Frank DeLuca, Anna Lee, and Joseph Perusco. Uh, if we're going to up that to, from five to six. The remaining three members then would be Bruno Carrara, Sheila DeLuca, and Kathleen Mann. And then I think we're just going to leave the 12 then for the accessibility, which I'd already read out. Why don't we make it 14? We're really adding numbers everywhere, right? So 14 on which one? Accessibility committees. And sure. Yeah, because it's a tie, so it'll be end up being five more. We'd have to decide who those two or those out of the remaining five would be. It'll be a party. Yeah, accessibility. So, uh, so did uh, Councillor Peter Angelo made the motions? Yes, we've got those. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have that seconded by anybody? Okay, Councilor Newestag, you're seconding that. Any discussion to the motion? Okay, let's vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Congratulations, everybody. Was it worth sticking around all that time? No. <laughs> but you will sleep like a baby tonight, let me tell you. Be your pants and cry all night. Okay, Mr. Clerk, uh, all right, where are we now? Item 11.3? Correct. All right, Victoria Center BIA. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange, that we approve the budget. All those in favor? See how nice that was? Unanimous. 11.4, Ontario Ombudsman, letter to Council. Recommendation from Councillor Peter Angelo. Do I have a second or second by Councillor Campbell? Yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know the recommendation is for staff to come back with amendments. <clears throat> the amendments that the, integ that the um, Ombudsman recommended or it just says amendments it doesn't say recommended amendments what amendments are they coming back with i don't know we can ask staff at the end of the day it's up to us though we'll decide what they're going to be yeah yeah so there are recommendations from the ombudsman you'll remember that uh, at the council orientation we had collected a number of comments about amending the current code of conduct i'll certainly include those and i will list the options uh, as the ontario ombudsman has uh, detailed in their letter uh, so at the, at the time, Council will have some options in that report as to uh, how to proceed and approve any updates to the Code of Conduct. Okay, thank you. And one other comment. We had a motion um, at last term about a whistleblower policy. There is one line in the Code of Conduct, but it's not a real whistleblower policy. <coughs> is that something that's coming back? Mr. Clerk, do you know that? Uh, I can certainly make comment in that staff report back and uh, to see uh, what council's wishes are there. Thank you very much. Okay, are we ready? We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, of the referral to staff. <laughs> so, yeah, for staff. Yep. For sure. Um, I, I would like to. Yeah, Councillor? Yeah, I, you know, we were paying out um, hundreds of uh, thousands of, oh, yeah. um, for the uh, intendory, the people, the lawyers, and if you don't have any fee um, that anybody can do it any time, and that would cost us a lot of money. I think we have to have a talk about this. Yep, well this will come back to council, then we'll have that for sure. Okay, moving on, 11.5, Resolution Town of Grimsby. Um, it's the will of council. Yes, Councillor Lococo? I'd like to move it. Okay, so you're, uh, it says for council's consideration, so you're moving the- So we're moving it, and I don't know, does that mean we send it out to other municipalities like they sent it out to Well, us? they've already done it, so- They've sent it out. Yeah. So I guess we're just approving it then? Yeah, or supporting it. Supporting it. Endorsing. Endorsing, Endorsing. Endorsing. yeah. Endorsing, thank you. Any other adjectives? We want to think of another <laughs> word? <laughs> That's the word they use. Okay. Yes. I'm just playing, it's getting late. All right, uh, motion by Councillor Lococo. Do I have a seconder? Second by Councillor Newestag, that we endorse the Grimsby resolution. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Now we go to 12, notice of motion. I, uh, there we go, so we've got uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's my understanding that we don't right. talk about it, we don't debate it, it's just going to come on the next one. 
So do we do anything? Uh, like, do we have to receive it? Do we do anything, Mr. Clerk, or it's just there? And I appreciate the councillor giving us a bit of a heads up. Uh, ultimately, she could have just spoke about it uh, tonight and submitted it in writing here at the meeting. Uh, so it's nice that we all have a bit of a heads up. Uh, she's correct. We should not uh, discuss it. It'll come back on the next meeting, and I believe there will be a staff report uh, to go along with that as well. Um, we, we'll make sure that we have all of the uh, the parties uh, available, uh, such as the uh, downtown, or sorry, the downtown, the Victoria Center BIA uh, representatives uh, to also be able to speak to it. Um, and yeah, we'll deal with it at the next meeting. Great, excellent. Thank you for that. There was no in-camera meeting tonight. Yes, uh, Councilor Coco. Um, where is new business under this one? Oh, it's under 12. I have two new business items. Okay, let's do it then. There was an article in the newspaper regarding um, the finding of SciTech. There was yes. a chemical spill. There were, they were fined in 2019. They were fined in 2020. We've had some discussions about the ARC that we're allowed to build and some people Did say Did you turn into a dance move just now? Yeah, I guess. Okay, come on, okay. <laughs> some people said it, 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 it's, um, it's a bylaw and it's a rule, it's a regulation and then other people have said that it's not. I was wondering if staff can bring back a report about what exactly is it, what, um, how, how far is this arc, what can be built, is it a bylaw, is it just something that we've been doing because they told us? I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I would like to, to look into that further. And then I guess my next question is, when there is um, a leak like that, do we get notified as the city? Uh, good question. I don't know that. Uh, do we? Does do we get Mr. CAO? Do you know the fire department? Who, who gets notified? Uh, just on the first uh, recommendation, the staff are staff are in discussions with uh, the company. So uh, my only thing is, we will bring back a report on that. It just may not be next cycle. Maybe a couple of cycles because we're asking questions of it. Uh, and I turn the other one over to the fire chief, Mr. Zambito. Through you, Your Worship. Um, we're in constant communications with not only SciTech but the other manufacturer of chemical um, occupancies in the city uh, with regards to their response plans and, and how would they mitigate certain situations. They're also responsible to do uh, annual exercises to which that uh, we're invited to those exercises. Um, so we are in consultation with them on a regular basis and if there ever was to be a leak in any one of those establishments, we would absolutely be notified and we would be there. So uh, if you have any other further questions or concerns, you can uh, definitely uh, reach out to me. Okay, thank you, Chief. So for our residents, do they get notified at all? Is there um, some sort of guideline about when we notify our residents? Again, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I believe um, through their emergency response plan, they also have an obligation to notify residents and that could be various ways, um, either going door to door, uh, through uh, local media, um, even if uh, some of the homeowners in the area, if they have reached out to SciTech and say, I'm the new owner, here's my uh, personal information, they will also do that as well. It is spelled out in their emergency response plan, uh, SciTech that is, uh, with regards to notifying the residents that are within that, that, within that boundary. Okay. Thank you. So that, that was my first one, so it's just direction to staff. They'll come back with a report. Mm -hmm. And then my second hey, Do I do the one move one more time? Just to say, okay, <laughs> good. That's, 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 that's not the only <laughs> dance you're ever going to see from me. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my last one, um, some of the councillors received an email regarding the Ontario Land Tribunal on River Road. Um, I have spoke with legal. Um, I'm not going to try to say your last name again. I'm sorry, Nitty. Um, I have spoke with legal and, and we thought that the best way to deal with it is that we put a motion on the floor that we come back preferably at a special council meeting and not wait till March 21st to get an update from Mr. Holinsky regarding the OLT hearing because there's some things that have happened since the OLT hearing started and um, I don't want to get into the rest of it, but there's some things that have, have happened since it started and might change the action or the end result. So I, we'd like, I'd like to get an update. Yes, Mr. Or Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Pinarte. Pardon me? 
I don't know either, but uh, what can we say here in open, I don't know, or in So, yeah. thank you to the chair, and I'm going to try and be as general as possible with my comments, given that this is pending litigation before the Ontario Land Tribunal. There's a hearing date scheduled on March 30 and 31, um, and the hearing, the matter is at a stage where matters have advanced to the point where every, everything is locked. The party's positions are locked, their evidence is set up, their witnesses are identified, <coughs> they're getting ready for the final hearing and determination. So I think there is, um, what I had expressed is, because this is an appeal, an appeal of a council decision, meaning that it's the tribunal's only dealing with the narrow issues and the evidence before it, any changes that this council would bring forward but we now and the hearing date will result in increased costs for the city it's because the tribunal will need to be advised oh well you know the scope of the the, uh, the landscape of the hearings going to change and that may result in some cost consequences for the city and i just wanted to say that as a general statement here uh, for consideration and that is um uh, there would be more detail that would be provided in the st staff report if it is needed, but um, changing the landscape of the hearing results in more costs for the city. I just wanted to make that point clear. Are you recommending that we change anything at this point? No? No? No, that what wasn't my... No, okay, okay. What, what I was looking for was an update no, in camera a, on the litigation. Um, of It's 5411 River Road. And I understand what legal is saying. Um, the information, maybe there's an opportunity to settle or change something. Okay. Should we be going in camera on that, this that, matter? I, I, like, I don't know. Probably. To so each should we do it now? Like, we're not going to call a special meeting to talk about one thing. I mean, we're here now. Can, can we waive the procedural bylaw to go well, in camera? We can camera? go in camera anytime. We can do it in camera. <laughs> I mean, we'll, yeah, we can decide to do that. Because anytime there's client. Uh, but this isn't on the agenda. I know, but any time we're going to get legal <coughs> advice for something, that it's not, it's not a decision. No. It's just an update your report. Correct. Yeah, you go to camera. You don't have to change the procedures. Okay. So uh, before we do that, is there anything else? Like, do you want to, we can do that last kind of thing? Well, I don't know how we can do an update because we don't have our other lawyer here. It's the other lawyer that needs to give us the update. Through the chair, um, the update can be very high level, but at the same time, my understanding is that the request came for a, an update from our external lawyer who's handling the litigation. And then my understanding is that following that update, um, they, you're seeking to have two new issues added, which in my, and then I would have a legal opinion arising out of that, which I've already sort of alluded to because I think it's general knowledge that changing the scope of an appeal at a tribunal at this late stage will ding us with costs. I, I, it, it's, it, it, maybe it would be easier to have a discussion in camera because right. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Right, okay. Well, we'll tell you what, why don't we just finish up. Did you want to say yeah, go ahead, Mr. Just, just procedurally, if we're going to entertain the motion or for a resolution, I can just verbally say it out for council to vote on. Just so it's done right. procedurally. Right, right, right. Well, do you want to first finish off? Is, do you have any other new, new no, business? No, that was it. Thank that, you. That was it. Is there any other new business um, before we... We don't, we don't have to vote. Yes, but we're not there yet. We're, what's that? Yeah, we're going to do that. We're not there yet, though. You don't want to go in camera? To get an update? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't either, but I didn't know if there's something we should be updated. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll have to vote if we're going to go on camera. Because I don't know what it is either. I don't know what that address is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was in conversation with um, Ms. Pignarty. I hope that's better. And I was waiting for a response for her to figure out where to go with this. When I didn't get a response, we connected today. Is it today? I know I was here today talking to you, but you, you sent me an email today to come in and, and speak with her. Had I known earlier, I would have done a notice of motion or whatever, but I didn't have a response. So we talked today about the proper way to do it because it is a legal issue. So I thought we couldn't go in camera to talk about it because uh, the public was not notified. So if the public can't be notified, that's why I talked about the special meeting. I guess the next one would be March 21st, and the hearing is on the 30th and the 31st. Well, at our next council meeting? 
You're saying I, I don't know if that yes. if that's too long yeah. to, to wait to to give um, direction to I our. Think she's no notice about a motion. No, but I want to find out from Ms. Pignarty, did, should we, what should, do you think we should be doing, Rita? Should we be going in camera today or at the wait for the 21st meeting to deal with it? Uh, through the chair, the longer it takes up, up until the hearing date to make any decision to change course, uh, the more significant the consequences of the tribunal. Okay, so if we're going to do it, it would be now, if we're going to do it. Yes, yes, Council. Yeah. Thanks, Your Worship. I, I guess just through you to our solicitor, is this something that you were going to bring us? I mean, it's it's pretty highly irregular that a counselor would stand up and ask us to go in camera on an OLT appeal, unless our staff is bringing it to us. If our staff is bringing it to us, to me it's a different story. I, I don't know that I feel entirely comfortable going in camera to talk about a change of course if it's not something that's being recommended from our staff. <coughs> Through the chair to confirm staff does not support changing any course at this time, nor was staff thinking of bringing this forward. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I don't know if it's a change of course. There were things that happened from when it was filed to now that might settle it. So we, we've been in different OLT situations where we've come back and we've settled and it didn't get to the hearing. Um, I don't know what else to say. So through the chair, um, if there is any settlement at this point, it is the appellant who is not the city that would withdraw their claim before the tribunal because the issues are now out of the city's hands. They're in the tribunal's hands and there's nothing further that we can do. Mr. Mayor, the appellant has told me that they have contacted Mr. Holinsky and didn't get a response. Uh, Ms. Pignarty has said that the lawyer has contacted the appellant. So I have two different things. One saying I don't have a response, one saying a response was provided. I'm, I'm just trying to follow up with the residents. Um, I, I, would, I would think, and again, I don't want to speak, uh, but I would think Ms. Pignarty, I've got 100% faith that she'll do what we need to do to do what's right for us, I would think, you know, rather than us engaging ourselves you know, in, in that aspect of a, an appeal. So I, I think I, the purpose of this is to get an update from Mr. Holinsky with this new information before the OLT hearing. That's what I'm looking for. Through the chair, another point I did want to raise is that the new information that the councillor is speaking of is also something the appellant is um, raising at the tribunal at this time, and the appellant is represented by counsel, and Mr. Holinsky can only communicate with counsel as well, just to be proper. So these issues or concerns are not for this forum, they are properly before the OLT, so staff is not in support of um, changing anything at this time. It's just not proper. Okay, well, I'll, I'll sit down if the other two councillors that were included in the conversation, if they have anything else, and I'll, I'll leave it with what our legal is, is um, advising. Okay. Uh, Councillor Campbell. <clears throat> I guess, oh, oh, it's on. I guess my biggest problem is that uh, we as a council made the decision to not allow this development move forward. Somehow it got to the Committee of Adjustment and they countered our decision-making process. Uh, I talked to the clerk about uh, quorum, or, or, or not quorum, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, majority uh, in voting, apparently in the Planning Act, three people make a quorum. Even if there's 12 members on the board, three people make a quorum. My point is, I can't believe that the Committee of Adjustment went contrary to decisions that we as a council made. That's my frustration. Okay, well, I don't know for the legal aspect, but you know that I don't know that we get engaged at this point. You know, if our solicitor is giving us advice, yes, Councillor Strange. I'm sorry, Mister. I don't know what they're talking about. So there's <coughs> councillors that know what's going on, and then there's six or seven. We have no clue. Yeah, I so don't. Either. Until we get this information, I, I can't even answer anything. Like, I don't know either. But maybe I think based on the advice from our solicitor, it's just as well. You know, because it's with our council. 
Mr. Holinsky, and he's dealing with it, and it's going to go to an appeal. And if there's updates, we can get an update at our next meeting. Not that we're going to change anything, but uh, but we could. I mean, we can get an update at the next meeting. I, I, I would be inclined to follow our council's advice. I would think. Is there any other new business for council to consider tonight? Come on, there's no new business? All right, motion for, no, motion for adjournment. Oh, wait, wait, no, wait, Mr. Clerk. A couple things. Uh, that, that just finished off section 12. Section 13, we do have a resolution. Uh, there was a, an email sent at 11 o'clock this morning, so I apologize for the late addition to the agenda. Uh, this is uh, regarding, uh, administratively, just for the mayor and the clerk to sign an agreement uh, with uh, regards to uh, phase four of the safe restart agreement stream to address COVID-19 municipal transit pressures for phase four. Um, administratively, uh, they need a resolution passed and the date for all this to go back to the MTO is uh, March 17th. So it needed to be addressed uh, today. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange that we move the uh, resolution spoken of by the clerk. If there's no discussion, yes, Councillor. Can we just confirm what we're, I don't know what we're looking at. It's, it's not, it came late, right? Did it come it's late? not on here at all? Uh, it should have been updated, I think, on the agenda. Uh, we can read off the resolution if you like, but it's uh, section 13.1. Uh, the resolution was added today. Um, yeah, it's on there. I, I'm speaking more of it from an administrative standpoint. Perhaps the uh, treasurer uh, could speak to what the resolution involves and the agreement. Uh, Ms. Clark? Yeah, through the chair. Um, this is just uh, to provide, as the clerk said, the safe restart phase four. This is uh, money for transportation. It's a grant of $926,518. And my understanding is they just require this resolution to give authorization for the clerk and the mayor to sign the agreement. Okay. Um, okay, we already had the motion. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay. And, I think so. Is there any other surprise resolutions, Mr. Clerk? Is that it? Okay. Bylaws. One, two, three. Motion to give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Motion for adjournment. adjournment. So Councillor Baldinelli, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Approved. We're out of here. Good. Awesome.